Friday, January 19, 2018. This is MMA Junkie Radio's pre-show, the show before the show. I'm Goes. That's Dan. That's TJ. When I point up, you know what that means. That's Danny Okers. And Gorgeous George is walking in right now. Hi, George. Hello. We're just setting up here, and we are <laughs> talking about <laughs> You could hear him say it. Huh? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking about Danny being in a band, and TJ DeSantis is telling us that he would like to be in a band, but oh. he doesn't have the talent for it, uh, unless... He could play the Do- Tom DeLong role in right. a band, at which I think he's actually pretty good. That's not true. Do you think? Oh, I'm not Tom very DeLong? good. I was kind of like making fun of Tom DeLong. But it was a good that's Tom DeLong. But that's how you sing like Tom DeLong. You yeah, that's true. <laughs> Tom, DeLong. <laughs> Tom DeLong of uh, Boxcar Racer, not so much Blink 182. Mm. I like Boxcar Racer. That one song. That's it. Is this the show before the show? Yeah, okay. it is the show before the show. No one told me about a show before the show, for the record. <laughs> Wait till you hear the show after twice. the show. The odds are going up on Nganu. The odds on Cormier have to stay the same. I did the last three days. The Burgos fight. Money's coming in on Burgos. The Volante fight. Money's coming in on Barroso. The Almeida fight still is the same. Hmm. Okay. But yeah, Ngannou's gone up to minus 220. He's the challenger, by the way, on Saturday at UFC 220. Excellent. All the fighters made weight. We'll touch on that when we start the show. I guess Bellator's doing their thing right now. They started at 9, which means they'll be over at 11. And according to the front page of MMA Junkie, Quinton Jackson's already weighed in. 253, Dan. Remember we said we like him better in the 240 range? Yeah, apparently he cut out the ketchup, but I, I thought... Cutting out the ketchup might get him closer to 240. I'm 253 okay with it is still a big. Though. 253 is still a big guy. Um, Lima and McDonald are on weight. Good. So we have a title fight there. Cool. They're slowly coming in. Uh, Cruckton and Pico are good. Corrales and Georgie Caracanyan are good. Coming up in a minute. So, yeah. Nobody missed weight in Boston. And so far, everybody looks pretty solid in Los Angeles. Both events are on Saturday night. Been promoting the three TV setup for years. If you're not on that, if you're not on that uh, train, I mean, I feel sorry for you. In this day and age, you have to have the three TVs: sporting events, video games, porn, whatever, man. You just need to have all three TVs rocking and rolling just at all different times. Different types of porn on the other TVs. Yeah, you nah, just, or you just know. a lot of it. <laughs> 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 I'm just saying, there's there's, uh, there's a lot of Different people that only like one sport. So okay, well then, your video games, your sport, and whatever else you want on the other TV. If you walk in on your buddy and he's watching porn, you think, wow. But if you walk in and he's watching it on three different TVs, you gotta think, dude, That's my buddy, cool. he's Stand a by. savage. <laughs> Captain speaking. We are making our descent into Las Vegas McCarran Airport. On behalf of our crew, we'd like to thank you for flying MMA Junkie Airlines. Now please fasten your seatbelts and put your tray tables in your upright position because the descent is going to be a little bit bumpy. <laughs> Hi, Junkie Nation. It's time to roll, baby, on MMA Junkie Radio with gorgeous George and Go. This is what we do and why we do it, baby. All night long. We roll it! Yes! The MMA Junkie Radio Revolution is upon us. Sad, you There's no escape. No escape. Through the vast frontier of cyberspace. And through a sea of stars in outer space. One small step for man, but by a leap for mankind. We've solidified our combat communication stranglehold. We are controlling transmission. With the use of MMA Junkie Radio and Sirius XM satellite radio technology. MMA Junkie Radio. Commence transmission. Live from MMA Junkie Radio HQ in the fight capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada. Here are your hosts, Gorgeous George and Goes. From the fight capital of the world inside the beautiful Mandalay Bay Racing Sportsbook, 
You are listening to the MMA Junkie Radio Show, the only show that matters. And I'm your host, Gorgeous George. With me, as always, is the devious and dastardly goes, or his co-host, back east, handling all the producing duties. It's Danny Otto. And, of course, to our left, he's our latest addition, Dan Tom Chillin. He's the fight analyst. Sitting to goes as far right is our co-host for the day. He is a legend in the MMA radio world. He's been doing it for such a long time on both sides, hosting and producing. And lately, he's moving over into the TV world. He is the play-by-play announcer for Invicta Fights. Also, EBI, that's the Eddie Bravo Invitational. And you've probably caught him on the Tachi Palace Fights as well. It's TJ DeSantis. Ah, you're ruining your credibility by saying I'm a legend. Uh, You are a legend. Thank you. I appreciate it. You've been doing... Uh, uh, a lot uh, for the sport of mixed martial arts for many years. Long time. Much now. respect, man. Yeah, no, thank you. I'm really happy to be here. This is like worlds collide. Like forever, it was Sure Dog and and Junkie and Tag and you know. So like, this is this is kind of neat. I never I feel like we never really shake hands on camera. Yeah, yeah, we did. This is like the Geneva Convention or something. <laughs> <laughs> yep, he's here from the mean streets of Minneapolis. Now uh, he's a SoCaler like like we used to be. Mm-hmm. Part of me still, still are SoCaler. Heart. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he, he's he's out here today, hanging out with us for all two hours for uh, our last show of the week as we lead into the first pay per view of the year for the Ultimate Fighting Championship UFC 220 tomorrow night. All the champions and challengers are set to go there. In fact, everyone on the card already made weight, and of course, Bellator 182 happening on the west side in Los Angeles, California, at what used to be called the Fabulous Forum. Bellator 192 with Chael Sonnen and uh, Rampage Jackson. The double main event, they're calling it. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> Easy. So what's happening there is, you know, we got a staggered uh, Grand Prix as well as a world title fight uh, with Roy McDonald challenging Douglas Lima for his welterweight title. And I believe McDonald, I believe everyone's made weight there as well. Uh, Chael hasn't weighed in, but how was, he's not going to come in over 265. So we're good to go there. So I, I'm excited. You know, we had that scare with Uriah Hall last year, and I thought, or last week, and I thought, oh my gosh, I hope it's not one of those years. But you know, I'm, I'm glad the the fights are ready to go. As long as somebody doesn't slip on a banana peel, we'll have some great fights tomorrow night. Hey, how, how do you guys feel about Lima and McDonald being the co-main? Because to me, like that's a title fight. Like the winner of that could legitimately like claim to being top three, top five in the world at 170. Mm-hmm. To have Rampage and Chael on, like I get it from a marketing and, and standpoint. Think about McDonald, what he can say. I beat yeah. Woodley. Exactly. You know, he can yeah. actually claim to be number one. Yeah. So to answer your question, I believe that the title fight. If you don't, if you're as a promotion aren't making your title sacred, then I, I think you're you're not doing your own promotion justice. And, look, I know they'll fire back and say, well, look, the Sun and name, the Rampage name, they mean something. This Grand Prix, it means something. But we don't have a champion just yet. You're in the process. It's just the quarterfinals, for crying out loud. And you can still put them on the poster and do whatever and market them a certain way. But I think the the last two that walk out should be the ones that have already, you know, yeah. One guy's bled to hold on to the title, and the other guy's had a, a championship drive for right. that title. Uh, in the World Cup, you don't watch the third and fourth place game at the end, right? Right. You watch Even if it's Germany and Brazil, place. and the World Cup final was Algeria and the United States. Right, exactly. It's about the organization and the it's belt. The NFL Everybody this weekend, you know the they belt. want the Patriots. You know they want uh, – Minnesota and Philly both have you know great following, so that doesn't matter as much. But you know they want the Patriots. But if Jackson won't – Jacksonville wins. Jacksonville's at the Super Bowl. That's just mm-hmm. the way it works out. Yeah, but I mean, here's the problem: mixed martial arts is always a blend of sport and entertainment, and it's not sports entertainment. It's not quite pro wrestling, but the the business model, the marketing of it, is, and that's why I think we're getting it this way. Um, the thing that bothers me, though, is Scott Coker has always said, you know, oh, a lot of people are going to tune in for you know Kimbo or Dada or Ken and Hoist, but they're going to end up meeting. Michael Chandler for the first time or, or a young prospect. People know Rory McDonald. It's not like we're going to be introduced to him for the first time. You're not going to get that sort of bait and switch, and people are going to be like, oh, my God, who's this Canadian guy if he gets past Lima? Uh, that, I don't know. I just it, it doesn't sit right with me from a sporting standpoint to have it be the co-main, but I don't know. I go back and forth on it because that being said, which is the one you can't miss, right? For me, I want to see, see Lima. Yeah, I want to see the title fight. But I bet you a lot of casuals would probably say, ah, if I can only see one, I got to see Rampage and, and Chael, which is, I don't think that's going to be a good fight at all. But Casuals run the world, right? Yeah. I mean, you can't make money in MMA if you don't have the casual fan. Who, who was your prediction, by the way? Chael or Rampage? I went with Rampage. 
I went with Chael. Did you? Yeah, and I feel a little bit good about seeing Rampage in the 250s. I'm not as impressed with Rampage in the 250s. He actually looked good when he was kind of holding court and doing a scrum the other day. Not that shit. That looks like a 240 guy. Mm -hmm. And But he weighed in at 253. He was telling everybody he gave up ketchup, had a long camp, and I was going to let Matt Erickson know. He's our quarterback there for the staff picks. Hey, move me over to to Rampage. But then I, I forgot, and I see these weights come in, and I don't know, man. It's just a, a big guy, you know. Do you remember when you were a kid and you would get that little plastic punch punching bag thing that you would hit, and it would bounce down and then bounce back yeah. up? That's what I think is going to happen to Chael if he gets hit by Rampage. I think he's just that much bigger. I think he's just going to... Oh, I mean, yeah, there's no doubt. He's got power, for sure. Um, and, and But that, that's the thing. is Chael has never had an ego. Hey, look at these hands. Granted, he's actually put a few guys down. Remember he, in Oakland, mm -hmm. he, he actually put Anderson down a few times. But he's never really been one to get involved in a firefight. I think he knows, I'm a wrestler, I'm going to take it. he's not automatic, out. right? I mean, oh, he, dude, he's as in, automatic in, as his he comes. in his division, he is. But look at like King Mo. King Mo's a bigger guy. But King Mo's got the ego. He boxes at Mayweather's but he, he gym. Tried he tried a lot of show takedowns, and Rampage fought him off. Right? True. Not every one of them were, were automatic. True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no doubt. And that's because Rampage has a wrestling background in high school and in college. Mm -hmm. And he's, a, he's an athletic guy. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's I it, hear you. If Chael gets flip, him down, there's a, a good chance. Flip. One of us a is a night. genius on Monday, and one of us has the E-Crow. But, but not I'm, only I'm sticking with Chael at this point. Not only does he need to take him down, he's got to do something about it, right? Because if he's thinking to he's go to the decision, decent top then game. minimum, he's got to... He could submit Hua. He could submit uh, Rampage. Well, mm -hmm. my, my thing is if Chael gets on top, it becomes a, a time game. I think the whole entire fight is a time game. Yeah. Like, I'm going to lean towards Quinton from the opening second of the fight, and every minute that goes by, that needle starts to mm -hmm. go sunning. And if Chael is able to get Rampage down, even not doing a lot, but maintaining the position... He's going to wear on Rampage. Rampage weighing 250 pounds. I don't know what his cardio is like. Uh, I mean, if he can't get back up or tries to get up, I mean, this fight could be really Quinton's for the, the winning for the first three minutes. But after that, we're in untested waters for Rampage. So Chael's a very smart guy. And the one thing he knows is that Rampage has power. Uh, he does not want to be a highlight film, a highlight reel on the, on the bad side. And so what he's going to do is he's going to go out there and wrestle. He can say whatever he wants and make side bets, and he will have to start the fight standing up three times because I just don't think there will be a finish. But either way, he is going to be ducking in for a double uh, and really, really pushing that angle. And he wants. He also is very aware of TBI, and, and at this point in time, he just wants to get through fights safely. I'm going to take you down. You're not going to hurt me. On to the next one, get paid, you know, same thing. What did you think of Chael's performance against Tito? Do you, do you think that Chael really fought that off? That one, I think, had something to do with uh, that layoff. You could yeah. just tell he was like a step slow. And, yeah. Because um, he can't be that guy against Corey. I, I think he also had anxiety. I think he also just... Chael Sonnen? Yeah. Anxiety? Uh, uh, sports performance anxiety. Yeah, he, hmm. he just didn't look like... You know, where you get these doubts. Hey, sure. I should have got this guy down. I get everybody down. So I, you just have a little bit of self, self doubt. But I think it was just knocking off some of that rust and cobwebs, you know, yeah. in competition. Um, if they were to fight again, I think it'd be a lot closer. I'm not saying he'd win, but I think it'd be a lot closer. But I, I, am, I am a believer in ring rust just because I've talked to enough fighters. Mm -hmm. Despite what Cruz says yeah. and a few others, uh, it's, it's a for real thing. And it's sometimes some people can shake it off in a round. Sure. Some it takes a whole fight. Has that fight been a year? Has it? I think so. It was like January or February Dude, of last the year. The sport just sucks our lives out. Yeah, but I mean, I, I look back and go, "What? Right? I had Quinta fought Diego last yeah. last April. Yeah, we're working on nine months right. since he hasn't fought. I was like, oh my gosh, where's my life going? That I'm so immersed in this, you know? But I mean, it's like, not stopping. The man. reason I bring up the length between the Tito and Rampage fight is when do you start talking about ring rust? Because to me, it was always kind of that year layoff. You know, time True. frame where you're like, oh, is he is he rusty? I mean, has has Chael knocked off the ring rust and has it you know accrued once again over the last year? I don't know. I think well, he's he fought Vanderlei in June. Oh, that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, 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 the, yeah. You're right. You're yeah, right. so he's you're you know right. he's flowing a little bit more. Oh, man, there's the there's different fight. types too. There's the guy that was injured that couldn't do anything. And there's the guy that just couldn't get a fight or didn't want to fight. Right, but was still or was kind suspended of in the gym. or something. Yeah. Different types, but yeah, I could see some of that. I, I'm just curious what Chael looks like. 
at, at heavyweight because he's it's really not heavyweight. You know what I mean? Like he is he weighed in yet? Like what's he gonna weigh? Like two twenty? Two twenty two. Two twenty two. Yeah, which was so heavier I mean, than he projected, and that was yeah. probably his walk around as a middleweight. Well, right? he's yeah, gotta sell that four pack abs. Well, yeah, can't I mean, get too big. That, that's that's two twenty two. That's like two seventeen, two eighteen, two nineteen with breakfast. You know what I mean? Like that's he's yeah. fully hydrated. Probably hasn't gone to the bathroom yet. Like. I don't know. Uh, it comes down to like what you think about weight cutting. It, Dan Henderson really never cut weight when he's fighting at 205 pounds, and he was one of the best 205 pounders of all time. Mm-hmm. Truly, I believe that. Um, maybe Chael Sonnen is that at, at 215 fighting at heavyweight. I doubt it, but if he beats Quentin, oh, Jackson, he's not going to win the tournament. No, well, I don't think anybody's going to win the tournament that's in the field. Like I like the wild card. Like I like the Dan Cormier alternate type of ending. Like I, I Do don't. Do they have an official, uh, you know, sub? I don't, I don't know. Official. Subs going I don't know what they were saying. Remember, we were Alternate saying like, where, where's like a Sergey Karatonov or someone like Chad that. Chad Griggs, Javi Ayala, Lashley. I don't know. Yeah. Just have them ready, right? Yeah. It's I a staggered tournament, so I'm sure they can, you know, fix as is. But just make it up as we go. I mean, that's that's what it seems like happens in tournaments, especially when they're not one night. It's crazy to me that Chael Sonnen was in that IFC tournament in 2003. You know what I mean? Like that had who as well, right? Yeah, Prangley that, had, that had Shogun, Prangley, Babalu, Jeremy Horn, Forrest Griffin. Some like I still there. think that's the greatest tournament assembled in mixed martial arts history. Really? Yeah, one night tournament, absolutely. The oh, one night tournament. Yeah, yeah. Good. I mean, if you want to go back to like greatest tournament, probably the first middleweight they called the Grand Prix in Pride, uh, where Vandalay beat Quinton in the finals. Like that was probably the best tournament. But one night tournament, Pepsi Center, man, that was amazing. Global yeah, domination. That's, that's tough to top. Yeah. I was going to bring up Rumble on the Rock, but that was a staggered tournament. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that one had Anderson Silva. Wasn't that at like 175, Kami, too? Wow. Jake Shields, John. Carlos yep. Condit, Frank, Frank Dave Manet. Dave Manet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, some names there. Um, all right. Now, TJ, you uh, noted the Ryan Bennett tribute that we had here. And, you know, we had breakfast earlier. But what I didn't know was that uh, he, he had a big impact in your life as well. Sure. I mean, um, yeah. S- similar to us, you were a listener, and mm-hmm. uh, we remained listeners while you actually, um, you know, became a radio host. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about that, because a lot of people are familiar with Ryan Bennett through sure. us talking about him. Um, so I started working in radio when I was 15, and when I got into MMA uh, a couple years after that. I immediately th- thought, okay, there's got to be a radio show about this. People need to talk about this. I want to hear, you know, educated discourse on the subject material and what's going on in MMA. And I just typed in MMA radio, and first thing that came up was MMA Weekly and, and Sound Off and listened to Ryan, and I was hooked, man. Like, I was going to community college during uh, that, that time period, and I, I only went for, like, six weeks. I never went to the class that I had during that time because I was in front of the computer. If you remember, you had to pay. You had to pay, like, a membership service to listen to the archive. Five bucks. Yeah, I mean, this wasn't a podcast generation. The word podcast was, I, I mean, I don't, I don't even know if I had heard of an iPod. I still kind of remember the commercial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the trigonomics commercial. The trigonomics commercial? Mm-hmm. No, but I'd, he'd say, they'd say something about, like, uh, you know, to support the show yeah. or whatever. And, um, yeah, it was five bucks. I paid my five bucks. See, I did it intermittently. I didn't have enough money. So, like, I would do it one month, and then my credit card max out. So I, I, I had to, like, lay off for a little bit, make two or three minimum payments. Then I got, like, $15 of free credit available. Then I got three more months. But, yeah, I mean, Ryan was uh, the pioneer. I mean, when you think about the history of, of mixed martial arts radio, uh, the first MMA radio show I can think of was Eddie Goldman when he was on IATA. Full Contact? Yeah, it, it, it wasn't Full Contact. It was on IATA, which was an online sports station based out of New York. Okay, but it wasn't called Full Contact Radio? No, it was No Holds Barred Radio no with Eddie Bar- Goldman. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and then uh, then Ryan, and then I think I came in shortly after that. The only thing that was on the air when I started my radio show was Ryan, and uh, I remember Nick Kalikas was doing Pro Karate Weekly. Mm. Um, so we're talking now, like 2004, 2005. But yeah, I mean, without Ryan, I would have never even thought about doing a radio show. You know, Ryan told me once he had an eight-hour layover in L.A. He was on his way to Hawaii. So I picked him up at the airport. He hung out at the house for a while. And I asked him, how did you even figure out that you could broadca- broadcast on the radio? And because he was a personality on NBC in the uh, Central Coast area, mm-hmm. I think San Luis Obispo area, his neighbor recognized him, you know, and he told him, the neighbor, I guess, just was a, a computer geek type guy. He just kind of knew ins and outs. And he told me, he goes, you know, I can get you broadcasting on, on the Internet. And Ryan goes, really? And he goes, yeah. And 
they set up something that was just minor, like out of a laptop and I think straight yeah. microphone or maybe him into the laptop and then slowly it just evolved. Yeah. The next thing you know, they had the co-host contest and well, think Frank about that Trigg time. was aboard, but crazy. And Frank, I, oh, sorry. And uh, he, he would even interview fighters by holding up the yeah. ball on speaker. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounded like that, unfortunately. But also at the same time. But you'll like, take it, though, you know, right? at, at that time, like, you weren't going into Best Buy getting a podcast set up. You know what I mean? Like, right. it, it was very difficult. And that stuff was really expensive. Like, it, it's a good and bad thing, I think. Like, the, the price of pro audio gear has come way down. So, really, anybody can go get invested with pretty decent gear for a couple hundred bucks. But... The quality of the gear, I think, has kind of gone by the wayside as well. But w when I think about Bennett, like, I remember listening at my, my girlfriend's house. She had, like, a 56K AOL, <laughs> like, welcome, you've got mail. And, like, oh. it was buffering like crazy. Now it's, you know, I have 100 megs down at home. I pay, like, 35 bucks for it. So it's, like, the connectivity issues. Like, Ryan couldn't really even stream at a high bit rate. You know what I mean? Like, he wasn't streaming in stereo. You couldn't do that. Um, and there was no forget about video. No. Nobody was even talking about video. No, and like also too, if you wanted to listen away from your computer, you'd have to like burn it to a CD. So you, you got to be like one of those lucky kids or rich kids that had a CD burner at the time in 2002, 2003, which I definitely didn't. How about when the planes would fly, fly over Trigg's apartment and all of a sudden oh. it gets super loud? Yeah. yeah. They pass the microphone back and forth yeah. on the road. I, 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 uh, I just never knew that Ryan was also, I guess... Uh, you know, the person that inspired you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I only got to meet Ryan one time. It was at UFC 59, and uh, he was such a, a cool, laid-back, easygoing guy. And I mean, MMA media hadn't really exploded at yeah. that time. No one was really, like – I mean, I don't think that there has ever been a real rivalry between outlets. At least I don't think that there, there has. You know, for the most part, even – MMA at its biggest, uh, it's still a niche thing. You know, like, yes, you have the fans come in for big events and, and polarizing personalities make it seem like it's a big deal. But at its core, the, s the group that makes up mixed martial arts on a daily basis, it's, it's a small niche group. And th there's no room for egos. And Ryan never had an ego. Whatever competition there was, it was just friendly. Yeah. I know that bringing up Rumble on the Rock again, that was actually a big outside the UFC uh, event. Yeah. And I saw Josh and Jeff there covering it, as well as some of the guys from Weekly. You know, but at that time it was like those two monster websites were right. basically running the show, and yeah. they got along great. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, I'm sure they each wanted to continue their sure. climb, but um, they pushed one another. Another thing, thing that, that I'm glad you brought up was Ryan Bennett. You know, now they have this contributor wing. For the UFC, and I, I think Brian at some point should go in that contributor wing. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, he, I mean, he worked for the UFC. Like worked, he directly did ten shows, right? Uh, yeah, Thanks. yeah. And uh, you know, he, he's uh, got Joe Silva on. He okay. This show is so big that if him and Trigg were discussing something, Dana would call. Oh yeah, and basically said, "No, no, no, that's not the way yep. it is. This is what happened." Blah blah blah. So you know, again, Wild West days. Access to the president. Joe Silva, who didn't do interviews and doesn't do interviews, same thing. And that's why the UFC came up with the rule that only Dana was going to do interviews because sometimes Joe actually spoke what was on his mind. He spoke the truth, and sometimes he was in disagreement with what right. upper management wanted to do. But He'd that show was – too. Excuse me? He would give away matchups too That show was signed. interesting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, that show had GSP rapping for crying out loud or at least attempting to rap. Uh, Eve <laughs> Edwards, Dean Thomas rapping. They, they had a rap contest. A lot. That that's the epic uh, Nick Diaz Sam rant. Sam Hoger. You know, I ain't no bitch. I ain't no bitch because uh, him and Joe uh, Riggs, Riggs had gotten into it at, at a hospital. Ryan Bennett would actually go. Let's talk to Rich, Rich Franklin. He'd call the MGM and just go. Can I have Rich Franklin's room? And yeah. Rich wouldn't be too pissed about it because not many people were giving Rich Franklin attention. It's a different so time. So he's like, yeah, yeah, sure, let's do it. Such a he was time. happy to be on MMA Weekly Radio and. It, it was it was something else, and Tim now Sylvia Turkey calling in the middle of a Chinese restaurant. Uh huh. All kinds and of and stuff. And now you got un, uh, fight pass fighters that just may not want to give you the time of day because it's yeah. you know. I, I think that the new generation of fighters don't know what it's like to you know take fights in barns in the Midwest where there there may or may not be uh, a rule set that is firm in place. I mean, I've I've gone to so many shows in the Midwest where. You know, a guy would get a little bit lippy in the crowd, and then before too long, he ended up going to his car or the hospital with an 0 1 pro mixed martial arts record because he would get thrusted in the cage. It, was, it wasn't it uh, was illegal, but it was unregulated in the mm -hmm. state of Minnesota and Iowa and uh, Wisconsin, I think, had like full on pride rules and, and like cages. It was nuts. Like, you never knew what was going to happen. And uh, 
the fighters now that are, are coming up, maybe sometimes the media obligations are a little bit harder for them to, especially when you're cutting weight. Like you got to be sympathetic to the to those guys that are, you know, going through a tough time, getting ready for a fight early on in their career. Maybe they don't have it, you know, down pat yet. But it's like there was a time when no one cared about even the best fighters in the world, and now people are interviewing, you know, these guys that are one one and zero, two and zero. I can understand some of them, but the, the the guys on the fight pass that maybe their media obligations aren't as strict as the other ones. Like, right. come on, man, what else are you gonna do? Right. You know, get mm-hmm. on there and make a name for yourself. Tell a funny story. They all want the quick route. They all want the big bucks that are out there. Uh, a lot of them don't want to work for it. It's not just uh, young UFC fighters. I just think it's just a young generation, man. They don't want to put in the work. If you want to talk music, they don't want to. You know, put out a few albums before they get to you know sure. the one that drops that's in- incredibly huge for them. The actors want the big roles, right. or some of them just want to be internet sensation. You know, it, it's all coming too quickly, and I think you, there has to be a grind. They're all entitled. These a, damn MMA millennials. Yep, there has to be a rise to the top. <laughs> Otherwise, um, you'll come crashing down. You may get yeah. there, but you'll come crashing down hard. So this is the type of show it's going to be. We're going to go back uh, in the history books and talk about our, our past. And talk about TJ's past, and you know he did so much with Sure Dog, and and now uh, he's calling fights, so he's had a, a wonderful career. But at the same time, we still will give our final predictions. We each got our latest odds in front of us, so we'll like we l- last few weeks, like we've been doing, we'll come up with some parlays for you to play for all you gamblers. Uh, and we also have Matt Brown on the show, so he unretired. Let's talk about that before we go to break. Matt Brown. He uh, he said he tweeted something along the lines of, "Hey, I said I was going to retire. I didn't say for how long, and pretty much I'm back." And so the rumor has it him and Carlos Condit are mixing it up sometime in April. There's no set uh, date or event, but your thoughts on him on retiring and the fight itself? I mean, the fight itself, the matchup is going to be fun because you know what both of them are going to do, right? I mean, you announce those two guys, it's kind of like one of those of uh, man, they haven't fought already, like. It, You've always wanted to see these two guys scrap. Right. You want to know that both guys are motivated to do it. Matt Brown to come out of retirement to want to do it, to me, says he's motivated. I don't think Carlos Condit, I think if he goes back and watches that last performance, I don't think it's going to sit well with him. I think he's going to come back and look different on this fight. What do you think, TJ? Uh, first off, Matt Brown coming out of retirement doesn't surprise me at all. His nickname is The Immortal. Mm-hmm. He'll probably fight forever. Um, this is uh, this is fireworks. Like I, I don't, don't see how this fight doesn't steal fight of the night. Yeah, like I just it, it's it's going to be pretty nuts. What you were saying goes about Condit's last performance. I think his last couple performances should really fuel him, and he's going to have to be on point because Matt Brown does not play. You know, right. and that's going to be a heck of a fight if 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 we see the Condit that fought you know Robbie Lawler, then I think we're really in store for something great. Um, what worries me about Condit is when he fought Maya, he said that Maya hurt him with a punch on the floor. And that worries me about his ability to, to take shots. I mean, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a neurologist. I can't tell a fighter when to retire. But when you're saying that Damian Maya is, like, causing you to, you know, have a little It was a, a punch flash, or yeah. an elbow in the yeah. eye? Or I, I, what? I believe it was a punch, yeah, okay. from, from back mount, he said. Um, but, uh, I mean, I don't know. He's been I'm excited awards, yeah. that Matt Brown's back. Yeah. He when he left, he, you know, the Diego Sanchez fight, he looked great. And I just I mean, he, I know he brought his kids in and it looked like if you wanted to exit, that was a great exit. But at the same time, just from covering him for so many years, it didn't look like a fighter that had reached that point. Mm-hmm. Um, he told us that if I'm not able to compete for a title, then I just don't want to just compete to compete. But, you know, they, they always say towards the end of career careers when you're making your, your biggest paychecks. So I don't know if it's maybe that. I mean, that's what we plan on asking them, but it, it could be a little bit of that, maybe those competitive juices. You know, you start making some sandwiches at home and taking your kids and, you know, doing some fatherly stuff. But at one point, do you just realize, you know what, my fiber is that of an athlete. I can still do it. I can still provide. It's his routine, right? It's what he's been used to for all there. these years. Yeah, well, so we'll, we'll when chat fi- with them about When that. fighters retire, I think they retire from training camp in their head. They don't necessarily retire from fight week and everything that builds up that they love to do. You know, that's that's the hardest thing to walk away from. But the camp, the dieting, the, you know, rigorous uh, – dedication that it takes to stay in, at the top of the sport that is tedious on a fighter and i think they can walk away from that but they can't walk away from that walk you know that walk in front of you know tens of thousands of people at times like 
that's hard to give up. Like, yeah. What are you going to do? Are you going to be a baseball coach for your son's team after that and still feel competitive like you're satisfying that itch? No way. Yeah. Have you ever been to a Little League game, though? You might get in more fights there. Than well, than in the Southern gym. California, yeah. In Minnesota, <laughs> not so much. Yeah, it's crazy, the competitive juices in baseball and SoCal. Like, yeah. All right, we're going to take a break here. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Series 67 Rush 93. We have TJ DeSantis in the house. He'll stay with us for these next two hours. Uh, I should say 90 minutes because half hour has already gone by. Now, we do have Matt Brown coming up, so stay uh, with us. We'll be right back after these messages.
They pat down TSA agents because they don't know where those people have been. And because they can. They are gorgeous George and Goes. And this is MMA Chunky Radio. Start your day with SiriusXM. Enable the SiriusXM skill on your Amazon device. And then tell Alexa to set an alarm for your favorite channel. You'll wake up to the sounds of SiriusXM with SiriusXM and Alexa. You can get the latest sports news each morning without picking up your phone or turning on the TV. All right. We are going to move on to our first guest of the day, Matt Brown. He's going to be fighting Carlos Condit. No date, no event. I'm sure some of you are going, wait a minute. I thought he retired. He did, but he didn't say how long he was going to retire, and now he's out of retirement and an active fighter again, and we couldn't be any happier. Goes a bunch of kids. When we shared it with them, what'd they say? Oh, they were so stoked about it. They, uh. That's kind of how I felt. <laughs> Joining us now on the hotline is Matt Brown. What's up, Matt? How you doing? What's up? How you guys doing? <laughs> We're excited to have you back fighting again, brother. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your retirement, and welcome back. I did, man. I retired for the holidays. And <laughs> started, started the new year off back with a new fight, man. New outlook, new determination, new will. We're back, man. Let's mm-hmm. do it. What, what, uh, I guess I imagine you approach the UFC, right? Or do they holler at the retired fighters from time to time and just say, hey, are you sure? How, how did this all come about? Um, I guess it kind of just came about. I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I told Sean Shelby, I said, you know, keep, you know, even though I'm retired, I said, you know, there are some fights that would get me right back in there and, um, you know, keep approaching me. And, it was actually the second fight that I was willing to come back in. I was, I was actually going to be the main event against Cowboy, and um, you know I was asking for that rematch, and I didn't get it because I di- I didn't want to take the fight on as short of notice as they had offered to me. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't have been, because of my retirement. I wouldn't be able to make the weight that quickly. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> um, with that said, you know, I said, hey, you know, just keep offering fights. If, you know, if there's the right thing comes up, uh, I will come right back. And um, I, I think the timing was right and everything, all the pieces, all the destiny came together. All the pieces came together for me and Condit to uh, run it back. You know, we were supposed to fight before. So here we are again. Had they not hollered at you with the right booking, you know, the right fighter, could you have just been content to just uh, continue to be retired, or do you think at some point you would have maybe been a little bit more aggressive with them? Like, I guess I wanted to know, did, did you, in your heart, did you know you were coming back at some point, or did it really just take the right guy, otherwise you're staying home with the fam? I'll tell you, you know, I didn't know for sure if I was going to come back, and uh, I was con- I-, I am content now with retirement. And that was the big thing with, with the whole uh, retirement. I was it really scared me the thought of retiring. It was it was really a nerve wracking thing, and I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, so I just kind of had to make it official, uh, which turned out not to be official. But um, at the time, it was official, and you know I'm not so scared of it now. I mean, a lot of opportunities come up. I've been doing a lot of work with Muscle Farm, and uh, specifically, and you know even other opportunities though, but. You know, that was a, a great opportunity for me that isn't necessarily an opportunity that, that's gone now either, but it's something that I will continue to pursue and continue to work with them. But, um, you know, just the point is just a lot of opportunities came up that I guess I just didn't realize were out there because I've always been so hyper-focused on the fighting. And it, it just made me feel a lot more comfortable, um, you know, with stepping away from the sport, just realizing there is another world out there and I can handle that, and I can be content with that. How did the family, your family, take that news? Did they want Daddy uh, to stay home, or were they happy that Daddy was back to being a pro athlete? Kids love me fighting. <laughs> That's kind of what I thought. They, you'd say. I mean, they, they they were jumping up and down when I told them I was fighting again. <laughs> they're like, yes, yes, and pumping their fists and shadow boxing, and yeah, they're all about it. They want to see me fight, and they want to see me beat people up so yeah they're excited i think the um you know the more adult family you know they it's kind of up in the area i think you know we see the pros and the cons there's you know 
they cer- they certainly enjoy my wife. You know, certainly enjoys more time with me. But mm-hmm. you know, we you know, she likes fighting too, and she likes seeing me accomplish what I set out to do. So we're in it together. UFC welterweight Matt Brown joining us here on the hotline. He is out of retirement, and he'll be fighting Carlos Condit in April. Site and date uh, has not been determined. I have a couple of co-hosts here. I have The Goes, Dan Tom, our fight analyst, and TJ DeSantis as well. Goes, what do you have for Matt Brown? Matt, so I want to make sure that I understand your frame of mind on this. So let's say uh, the fight comes, you get the victory. Is it going to be a fight-by-fight basis? Like, in other words, if they give you another one of those names that you like, will you continue to do it? Or would you kind of just get back into the rotation and whoever's next in the rankings move on from there? Yeah, so, you know, a, a lot of it's going to depend on how I feel throughout the camp, really. That's really the, the big thing is, um, you know, specifically like when, when I announced the retirement, uh, uh, you know, I had this fight with Diego and, and my body was hurting real bad and just not getting into shape the way that I had when I was younger and, just, my mindset wasn't really there to take the kind of abuse that I've been taking, um, but it turned out to be an amazing camp. I surrounded myself with the right people, and I felt amazing during the whole camp and, and amazing during the fight. So, assuming that you know, I'm gonna, you know, I'll keep the same people around me, and assuming everything goes as well uh, throughout the camp, um, you know. Not you know, irres- irrespective of whether it's a win or a loss, if I feel that good again in camp, I'm gonna keep fighting. If my body doesn't hold up, if I if I can't mentally push through some of these sessions and and feel motivated and and hungry, then um, again, regardless of a, a win or a loss, uh, you know, I'll probably stop again. So okay. you know, there's there's a lot of things up in the air with that. You know, a lot of people know camps cost a lot of money. Uh, A lot of your soul goes into that, a lot of hard work. Should the situation arrive where Carlos can't make it to the dance, how much is it about it, the opponent being Carlos? In other words, if they offered you someone else, would you continue with the fight, or was it a lot of it about Carlos and you would just go back to being retired? No, that's a really good question, and, you know, we'll have to cross that bridge if we get there. Um, I think Carlos... He, he's certainly not a guy that pulls out of very many fights, and he um, certainly has a smart camp around him, and I, I think the chances of getting to the fight are very high. So, um, you know, I'm not really worried about that right now. And again, if, if that does happen, I'll cross that bridge then. Hey, Matt, I'm, I'm curious. In the USADA era, you know, fighters that uh, are retired are not necessarily subject to USADA testing during that time. And uh, I'm curious if you've been tested in the time that you've been on this hiatus. And if not, were you subject to being tested? Or would you have to go through a, a waiting period similar to a new acquisition to the UFC and, and wait that four-month um, you know, testing phase like, uh, say, Angela Hill did when she came back to the UFC? Yeah, so I, I never did pull out of the USADA testing pool. I never suspended my contract. I actually you know, I never got that far with it. I was kind of... I was really like right on the cusp of doing all that stuff and never really pulled the trigger on it. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I never, I haven't been tested since the fight either. So I don't, I don't know if that's coincidence or how that worked out, but either way, I haven't been tested and I don't care. Come test me every day. I mean, you know, I'm a clean guy. I always have been, always will be. So they can come test me every day. It's, it's you know, and I've fought enough juiced up guys that, you know, I don't care if they test my opponent either. It's, it is what it is. Uh, Matt, now have this you know this has only been 24 hours since all this went down, but is there an update on where you guys may fight, uh, the event, or anything like that? Um, I haven't heard anything, and uh, you know I, I don't you know really probably wasn't even supposed to be announcing it, which I didn't announce it personally. Um, you know I, I didn't put anything out there, so obviously somehow everybody found out, but you know I didn't even tell anybody, so. Um, I haven't heard anything, so, you know, I know the, the date that I was told was April 14th, but um, other than that, I don't know anything. Okay. Uh, well, it was MMAweekly.com so. that had put something out uh, first, and everybody obviously just credited them and went with it, but the 
Twitter sphere went nuts. I know a lot of people from Junkie Nation are big Matt Brown fans. They were going nuts, and they were, you know, they were telling us, "You got to get them on. You got to get them on." So that's why we got our hustle on. But uh, I wanted to ask you, what about aside from your family uh, and your teammates, social media and, and your phone? Was it blowing up? What, what kind of support did you get for the this this news that came out? Uh, yeah, definitely the social media blew up, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, there's nothing that blows up a fighter's social media than getting a fight, so uh, or winning a fight, one of the two. So yeah, that certainly blew up. Uh, my phone, you know what I mean? I contacted most of the important people, and I'm pretty good about just keeping my phone to the side, and, you know, I reply to the people that matter. And um, Other than that, I kind of keep every, everybody else on the back burner, you know, no offense to them or anything, but um, I got to, I think it's something, uh, if there's a New Year's resolution of mine, that's probably the number one. It's just unplug a little more, get my, keep my mind and, and, and body and, and spirit into, you know, what's actually around me and not, you know, in this, you know, little matrix, you know, that we hold in our hands. So, uh, you know, I'm really trying to keep away from that a little bit and, yeah, so again, you know, a lot of people text things but or call or whatever, and you know, they just kind of get put on the back burner. Very cool. All right, this is Matt Brown, folks, UFC welterweight. If you haven't heard, he's back, and he'll be mixing it up with Carlos Khan at some time in April. Dan, Tom, what do you have for uh, Matt Brown? Matt, I got, uh, I got two questions for you, but it's actually based off a fight that's probably from like 10 years ago, if you, if you bear with me. Now, you fought Douglas Lima back in the day. In fact, you were the only only man to this date to, to TKO Douglas uh, in a promotion in a regional promotion back in the day. One, um, do you remember that fight? Because I was watching it, and, and one, I'm just like, man, okay, I, I, I totally get Matt, my Matt Brown's back. Why, why would I think this guy would stay retired? But two, at the end, I don't know if it's G uh, George Gurgel or one of your coaches, but they're expressing how proud they are of you. It feels like you and your coach had a moment. Do you remember what I'm talking about, Matt? Absolutely. I remember that fight very well. It was one of the toughest fights even today that I've had in my career. Douglas kicked my legs. Probably, I don't know if it was more times or harder than anybody else, but my legs hurt worse than uh, they ever have in any other fight. Uh, we had a, a really great war. Uh, you know, we really pushed it hard. And, um, you know, I was brought in there to Atlanta, his hometown main event. I was brought in on short notice to be a sacrificial lamb and, I don't think uh, nobody, including my own coaches, George, probably didn't expect to happen uh, what did happen. And, you know, uh, I went down there and, and got the victory. So, you know, I think that, you know, George, I, I think I certainly opened his eyes at that point. I don't think I was, at that time, I, I don't think I was some you know, young prospect of a talent or anything. They just see me as, you know, a hardworking, cool guy to have in the gym. And, uh they kind of opened everybody's eyes, man, and, and said, look, I'm a force to be reckoned with, and I'm going to push every single fight to the to the brink, man. We're going to go to the threshold, and, um, you know, you better be able to survive it. So, yeah, so I, I think it opened a lot of people's eyes, and it was a great fight, and much respect to Douglas, man. He's an amazing fighter, and he's done great things. So, you know, I'm happy to see him doing well. That's awesome, man. That's beautiful to hear because I could really that really stuck with me seeing you and you and George in that moment. And on Douglas, the second part of that question is: Do you have a prediction maybe for this weekend on how you see Douglas doing against Roy McDonald? You know, to be honest, I could see it going either way. But the big advantage that I give Roy is probably in the wrestling, and and I think you know it's a tough prediction to make, but if. You know, if I was Rory's corner, I, I think that, uh, or Rory's camp, I think that the best uh, case for him is to, you know, out wrestle and win rounds that way. Um, you know, the the striking on the ground I see is pretty much even. So, but uh, you know, obviously that could be uh, disproven. So, I think if Rory um, uses his wrestling and controls a little bit with that, he, he'll get a victory. Um, I think if he does it, then I think it's kind of a 50-50 fight. So I'm just going to ask you one last question before we let you go. That night when you fought Douglas Lima, you won the vacant ISCF East Coast Welterweight Championship. What would you do with the belt? 
I still got it somewhere. Um, I saved it and boxed up somewhere. I have no idea exactly where, but I have uh, the uh, these Rubbermaid storage totes of all my UFC memorabilia. All my I still have my first trophy from my first ever fight. Really? Uh, it's broken, but I still have it. Uh, <laughs> For some reason, you know, I, I, this I, feels yeah. like a belt that'd be cool, like a cool collector's item. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, everyone's yeah, always think, shooting for uh, UFC and Pride and Bellator, but you got a guy. I mean, these two fought 10 years ago. They both made names for themselves. Matt's got a big fight coming over his continent. Liam was defending his title. And we've never really even heard of this uh, promotion since then. It just kind of seems like one of those. Be, be like, nice to have in your collection. Yeah, cool little cool, cool belt to have, yeah. That's why I was asking. I agree. Yeah, and that's why I've, I've always kept as much stuff as I can. Um, I've moved – uh, yeah, a lot of times, so a lot of good things get lost, and I'm not really that organized of a person. But I mean, I have a whole room full of memorabilia that I've kept, and people are always asking me for it, and I tell them no because um, I want to give it to my grandkids, and cause, so that's you know that's where I'm at, man. But we'll see. You know, I got that belt somewhere for sure. I know it's broke. The actual uh, uh, metal or you know aluminum, whatever it's made out of has fallen off of the leather part, but I do have both pieces still. Matt's fought at an event called uh, Fright, uh, Fight Fest, Real Fighting Championships, Broken Reflection, <laughs> GFL Brawl at the Buckeye, and how are Higher Power Fighting. Wow. Dude's put in some time, right, when you hear mm -hmm. promotions like that? <laughs> that's, a, that's quite a career. Yeah, well, back, back then, you know, those, those promotions popped up all over the place, and a lot of the guys were just, you know, I, I mean, like the higher power promotions, like th this guy was just a, he was a guy I actually worked for. Um, and, you know, we did construction work and he just bought a cage and we would just put it up anywhere. <laughs> you know, he, I mean, I remember one he did at a gas station parking lot and an event and uh, an event, a wow. gas station parking lot in, in this shitty little town called New Lexington, Ohio, which I think it is probably 500 people in the town at best. And, it was actually kind of cool, man. Like, we warmed up on the gravel, and, you know, the, the commission didn't even... Um, was the commission? The commission didn't even approve of it. So, there was, there was no doctors. Actually, a funny story I'll tell you real quick All right. uh, before we get out of here. So, so the, the doctors never showed up, and the commission was like, you know, you guys can't put this on. You're in a fucking gas station parking lot. You don't have a doctor. You know, and the promoter, he's like, he's like, man, he's like, I don't care. I'm... I'm doing this. He's like, suspend my license. I don't care, whatever. So, you know, all the fighters are there and everything. And so we get out there, and uh, I, I knew the referee. I'm not going to mention him by name, but I knew him pretty well. And this guy uh, takes me down in the first round, and he's elbowing my face. I'm all cut up. I got at least two or three cuts on me. He's calling me names. He's like, you're a little bitch. I'm going to mess you up. And I think I can cuss on here, right? Yeah. Just, just internet radio. Yeah, he's like, he's like fuck you. I'm a fuck you up, you know, while he's elbowing me. Uh, you know, it is, I'm like, gosh, man, this sucks. I'm getting elbowed. But, and then the second round comes out, he's just completely gassed. I mean, can barely even stand up. I push him off of me in between rounds. Um, he comes out, he shoots, he ends up on all fours. Uh, I spawn, he's on all fours. He can't move at all. Um, so I just start, I stood up and just start soccer kicking him. And the, uh, the referee is looking at me and he's like, Hey, he's talking shit. I don't care. <laughs> so, Holy shit. You know, like, the referee was my buddy. Too, right? so, so I'm just soccer kicking this guy pride style and he's just covering up. Uh, the fight gets stopped, you know, and now the bad part, there's no doctors there. So this guy's, you know, just concussed all to hell. Uh, I'm cut all to hell. Um, and me and him, you know, we just went and had some drinks after and, that was that's awesome. That was, uh, that's you know, awesome. Those were the times back then, and it was, a, it was a lot of fun. And you know, there's a lot of little stories like that that you know were. Uh, it always ended with us having beers afterward, though. So that that was the great thing about back then. That's and really we call cool. fights. So I don't know about you guys, but my mind would be going nuts, going. Oh, his gas tank's a little low. You know, anything yeah. that has to do with the gas station or uh -huh. whatever. Your car uh, is going to be through the roof if you're fighting yeah, it. Yeah, sure that's wrong. fuel for fire. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's a great story, man. Thanks for sharing that, Matt. And, and hey, we're happy to have you back in the sport of mixed martial arts. And, and thanks for giving us this interview. I hope you have a, a great weekend and a safe camp. And hopefully we can touch base before the fight. 
Absolutely. Anytime, guys. Thanks right. so much. Thank you, Matt. Take care. All right, folks. All that's right. Matt Brown. I am the immortal on Twitter. Give him a holler. Tell him you heard him on the at MMA Junkie Radio Show. We're going to take a quick commercial. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Series 6M, Rush 93. Stay close. We'll be right back. TJ DeSantis in the house. Passion, common sense. These guys have none of that. You listen to them, so you're no better. I am awesome, though. They are gorgeous, George and Goes. Barstool Radio is on Power 85. Hear from some of the Stoolies' favorites, such as El Presidente de Portnoy, Pat McAfee, Big Cat, and more. By the common man, for the common man, listen to Barstool Radio on Power 85. All right, we're, at, we're up against the clock. So uh, let's just talk about what's happening in the second hour. We want to get some more stories from TJ. We've already talked about his inspiration of Ryan Bennett. How did he get to Sure Dog and that wonderful ride he had with Sure Dog. And, of course, now the blossoming career on the UFC Fight Pass. Heck, the two shows that he's on are the two highest rated. Uh, Invicta, Fighting Championships, mm -hmm. and uh, EBI, Eddie Bravo Invitational. They do very well. And uh, he's also done work with uh, Tachi Paz for a long time as well. Plus, we got to get a parlay out of each and one of us. We all got our parlay sheet here in front of us. Just the latest here. I'll let you know that the challenger, Francis Ngannou, is up to minus 220. The champion's at plus 170. If you're a Stipe believer, and remember, Stipe gets past Ngannou. Many will say he's the greatest heavyweight of all time. When are you ever going to get the greatest heavyweight of all time at plus 170? So if you're a believer, you just got to go up there. Put it all on the line. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. I mean, that's what gambling's like. It's half the time, or most of the time, it doesn't work out. If you're an Ngana believer, and he gets past Stipe, when's the next time he's going to be as low as 220? You know, this is going to be a guy that's going to be like minus 600, minus 700, go forward. Who knows? Anyway, interesting. We can talk more about it when we come back. Again, it's MMA Junkie Radio on Series 6M, Rush 93. We'll be right back.
right, here we go. It's the second hour of the MMA Junkie Radio Show. We got TJ DeSantis in the house. Longtime host of many shows on the Sure Dog Radio Network. Doing some producing as well. Doing some uh, play-by-play. He's all over the place. He's a mogul. He's becoming one. Um, TJ, what's your favorite, by the way, when it comes to producing, hosting, and or just calling fights? Yeah, I like calling fights. Um, yeah. you know, a lot, there's nothing better than a live broadcast mm-hmm. experience and environment. And uh, that's, that's what I started doing uh, when I was like 15, 16 years old. And uh, the way that the whole media platform has changed with internet radio and whatnot, it's, it's pretty rare to be in a big production type of environment where you know we have a and Invicta we have a whole trailer full of people I don't even know everyone's name mm-hmm. and, and everyone's responsible for making the show work and uh, th- there's nothing that is better than that personally um, I love radio though radio will always be my bread and butter you know I like uh, I like producing um, I like hosting I like taking calls that's that's my favorite thing is interacting with people um, yeah if I had to pick though it, it's calling fights are you okay if the caller's a bozo or uh, does that have to be an intelligent caller I mean I'm 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 the guy that'll just hang up on somebody in a, in a minute. So if somebody gets ridiculous, I got a bozo for you. Want to hear from him? Who is it? All right, this is Brandon from Louisville. What's up, Brandon? How you doing? So I was 16 years old when I first saw another man's penis, and it kind of terrified me. Brand- Brandon, you're on. Like you're on the air. Brandon, you're on the air. Uh, you're on the oh, line. Sorry, 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 guys. Uh, we were telling stories here about. Um. Anyway, so uh, fight this weekend. Uh, two things. <laughs> y- y'all caught me off guard. Um, the main event. Now, I know the UFC never, ever, ever plays favorites. Oh. But if they did, if they did, who do you think is the better long-term story for them coming out of this to win? Is it the all-American firefighter, great with the media, speaks to English, dominant heavyweight champion Stipe? Or is it the hard luck story, the orphan boy from a war-torn country that worked his ass off to reach the pinnacle of the sport? Who would like to go first? The guy that looks the most menacing on the poster and has the most vicious highlight reel. Yeah, I believe it's Nganu. However, I will say this. If these guys were to have a Bigfoot, Mark Hunt-esque type of fight, that goes back and forth, and both guys show a lot of heart. Great chins, great recovery. But at the end, Stipe can get him, climb the fence, have one hell of a post-fight speech. He breaks the record. And then all of a sudden, he just really, really grabs that title of baddest man on the planet by the throat and just kind of becomes a little bit, comes out of his shell a little bit. I bet you the UFC wouldn't be too unhappy, you know? Um because to beat a guy like that that looks like as terrifying as Francis Ngannou, who has his fair share, and to take his best punch, I mean, I think his statue would grow. But but, um, then, but then who do you give him as the problem? I know, I know, you're right. Other but than but Kane? but his question, if I just want to answer the question, it's Ngannou. That, that I believe that's where they can go further with it. But I do believe there's something there. Um, now, would Stipe be that guy? Probably not. You know, are we probably gonna get that fight? Probably not. These guys get too hard. Someone's going to get clowned on the button, and that'll be that. But under that scenario, a classic. Um, and if he was just a l- I mean, we're not asking for too much more. We don't want him to be chael, but just be a little bit, you know, a little bit more, mm-hmm. you know, a little bit more bravado. Um, and But Stipe's open about it. He's like, man, that's just not my style. So you think Ngannou easily, right, TJ? Yeah. I mean, I hate to say it's a cop-out answer that I have, but it is. Like, I think it's a win-win situation with both. If Stipe Miocic wins, he breaks UFC history. You can tout him as statistically the greatest UFC heavyweight that has ever walked the planet. Uh, Francis Ngannou, if he wins tomorrow night, it's like the climax of a major motion picture. You know what I mean? You know, start working in, a, in, in the trenches and it's going through literally a living hell and then taking life by the horns and in five short years becoming the baddest man on the planet. Uh, for Ngannou, uh, win, lose, or draw tomorrow, I think he's going to be a UFC champion at some point. I mean, he's so young into his career, um, but I, I don't know. I, I think it's a win-win situation either way. Ngannou will have a title at some point, but uh, is it tomorrow? I, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. Dan Tom? I agree that it's a win-win situation, but taken aside, I, I think I, you know the immigrant mentality is strong, as Joey Diaz would say, but uh, I think the, the, the more you know story in that sense is definitely Ngannou. 
And I like what George says about, you know, the best case scenario for Stipe. The problem is I, I don't see that happening. I see I could see all of it happening except for maybe the end where he grabs the mic and takes the mantle because, A, that's been the criticism of Stipe. But even going back and watching tape study, like aside from when Remember he – how he acted after he knocked down Verdum? That's what I was about to say. Okay, yeah. No, no, that's what I was saying. Aside from when he, when, when he wins the title from Verdum, he's – even in his, like, other videos, like Orlovsky, he's, like, almost, like – Passive aggressive, like Joe's like, how do you feel? He's like, I feel pretty good. I won, I won didn't I? He's like, well, yeah, yeah, you did. Well, yeah, and like almost like pass. And I'm, I'm a fan of Stipe, by the way. Like I'm picking Nagano. My heart is for Stipe. I generally side with the veteran, the sitting champion. Like I'll, I'll, all that ch chips are with Stipe. But if I'm being honest, like that is really tough work around. Forget like quote unquote media criticisms and how he interviews. But even that post fight, what George is saying, the important part was going to take the mantle. Like. I don't know how that's going to play out, even if he does. Like, especially, I only imagine that passive aggression is going to be even worse with all the hype they've thrown in Ngannou and that chip that Stipe is coming into this fight with, his with, his, with you know, that's on his shoulder. Does the manner in which the fighter win, does that matter? Because if Stipe, he just needs to win, right? And he does everything TJ said. Yeah. And Ngannou, if he wins kind of a boring fight, does it leave that lasting effect? Can Ngannou have a boring uh, fight? I think you know he's got saying? equity, though, built up, where mm -hmm. if, if he were to take a few rounds or even the decision – over Miocic, I think people would understand. He's the world champion. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, we had to throw yeah. all the tools at this guy to, to beat him. Brandon, let me get a quick prediction out of you. Uh, who do you have in the Miocic and Gunn fight, by the way? The fans win. <laughs> <laughs> That's minus and minus uh, uh, 9,000? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've got Ngannou. I, I, uh, I think it's going to be first one to the punch, and I think Ngannou's going to land first. My man, thank you very much for the call. Does the fact that he's a part-time firefighter, do you think that's something the UFC's at some point just, well, not, not? I mean, I know they have. It seems like that's something they've never been comfortable with. Just a guy that's, you know, doing something else and then comes out to fight is, by the way, your heavyweight champion. Do you think that's always bothered him? Would they rather have full-time athletes? Like, you know, we're almost we're just beginning our 25th year into the history of the UFC. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't think they've ever really wanted that either. I don't think Stipe's really gone out of his way either to, to talk about it, right? Like, you kind of have to pull things out of him. Right. Stiffing. He's a reserve firefighter, by the way. He's no longer a full-time fighter. He's a reserve firefighter. But um, I always felt like if you were going to remain with the – if he's proud to be with them, you know, and, of course, the the benefits he'll get upon retirement because that, that's going to hit pretty soon. That will be huge for him and his family. Um, so I get that. But did you see the – Boston firefighters showed up and Pretty gave cool. him, I think, a sweatshirt yeah. and everything. Oh, if nice. he could get, like, like uh, civic uh, workers behind him, not just firefighters, but civic workers behind him or something, just there's got to be a rallying cause. Every fighter like can find Like Guida, it. the carpenter. Oh. Exactly. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, and, and so cozy up to that. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think Steven could be a lot bigger than he is, and but but beating, you know, a monster like Ngannou can but definitely help. But if he hasn't gone out of his shell yet, do you really think it's going to happen with a victory this weekend? I think that's well, just kind of who he wants to be, who he's been, and I, I just don't think it's going to He's a change. Midwesterner. I mean, you mentioned passive-aggressive. In Minnesota, we call that Minnesota nice. <laughs> you know, like the Midwesterners aren't crazy, you know, outlandish people. Stipe Miocic reminds me a lot of people back home. Um, uh, for me, you mentioned the, the firefighter thing. That's been part of the process for a lot of UFC fighters. Like Eddie Wineland was a full-time yeah. firefighter. Chris Lytle, I remember interviewing him a decade ago, and he'd be hitting pads at the firehouse. You know, mm -hmm. for, for Stephen Miocic, if you take that away from him, he might lose part of his identity. You know, it maybe even, you know, clams up even more. I don't know. Did you hear him on the Rogan show, the Rogan experience? I did yeah. not. I thought he came out of his shell a little bit there, but, yeah. like, the thing is, is he was on for, you know, an hour plus. Uh, in, a, in a short three-minute interview, you know, post uh, a knockout or whatever, you, you don't know what you're going to get. You're not always in your right frame of mind. I, I don't think we've really been able to get to know Stipe Miocic that much. Uh, Here's why I think he can mind. come out of his shell. Because when boxing, when MMA versus boxing was hot in the summer, a few of the athletes were doing it. People yeah. chirping at each other. Well, Stipe actually was chirping yeah. at Joshua, you know. I think he also saw, wait a minute, a lot of money be made. <laughs> You know, maybe I do have to flaunt this. So, again, if you're not going to be good at it in live situation with the mic, be creative on social media. It can go far. You know, I think Khabib Nurmagomedov is one of the best at it. His English is very good for most Russian athletes that you come across. Yeah, sure. You know, you can actually have a conversation with them. 
the slang he catches on to a little bit more, but he's really creative with social media, and that's why he's got this massive following. I mean, there's a lot of Russians that are doing well. Of course, not many are 25 and up, but still, there's a lot of Russians that are doing well. But uh, you know, but yet this guy is uber popular. Mm -hmm. So there's always a way for these athletes to to do that. All right, uh, TJ. Now talk to me a little bit about Sure Dog. Uh, you shared with us the story. I'm sure people, uh, listeners of your show, kind of know it, but a, a little bit more uh, grassroots. You're inspired by Ryan, Ryan Bennett, and uh, your con you know how did you come in contact with Jeff Sherwood, and how did that all begin? So Quentin Jackson in 2004 put out his uh, phone number on the Sherdog.net forums, and I called him one day. He answered. I immediately hung up. I was like, oh, shit, that's, that's Quentin Jackson. <laughs> I should probably say something. He called me back, called me an asshole. Uh, I then called him two days later, hoping that enough people had called where he won't remember my <laughs> phone number. And then uh, I got to do an interview with him, and uh, I contacted Jeff Sherwood and was like, hey, will you run this? And he's like, yeah, sure. We've kind of thought about you know flirting with the idea of doing a radio show. And uh, we, we put it up there, and uh, I said, hey, I'm going to continue to do this. Uh, I'd love to do this again for you. And he's like, yeah, we're, we're not really there right now. Um, during this the time, was pre ESPN, right? Uh, oh yeah. Long, this is probably four years, three, four okay. years okay. before ESPN. And, uh, so then I worked for a website called inside um, did the show there for a year and a half. It was called MMA evolution, uh, with me and my friend, Caleb Quinn. And, uh, I was training then I wanted to be a fighter, not really wanted to be a fighter. I wanted to learn jujitsu and didn't have money. So I trained with a fight team and got beat up too much. But uh, so I, I met Caleb there, and we, yeah, he worked in radio in southern Minnesota, so we decided to do the radio show together. And then uh, after a year and a half at Inside Fighting, I called Jeff again. I was like, dude, you got to hire me or I'm going to quit this thing because this sucks. I wasn't getting paid. Like, everyone wants you to work on potential. We'll give you 10% of all of our ad revenue. It's like, well, 10% of nothing is nothing. My time is not potentially worth money. It is worth money. And uh, so Jeff finally said, okay, come over here. He gave me a box of DVDs each month. I would unload them on eBay, um, which was a nice little way to make money because I'm a part-time disc jockey, you know, playing Disturbed and Godsmack and Power Man 5000 on the FM. Wasn't making a lot of money, uh, but I had access to the studios there, and that's where we recorded, which, I mean, for the space at that time, no one was working with high-level radio gear like, like right. I had access to. So we were immediately... Uh, S sticking out compared to you know Bennett and then like I said Pro Karate Weekly and we had, we had pretty good listenership there and then uh, you know at SureDog uh, I was lucky enough to get a full time job when Jeff sold the website to uh, Crave who uh, still owns SureDog today and uh, I worked there full time for just about 12 years and you created a whole network there was yeah. quite a few shows going yeah, on yeah Jordan Breen show I mean we worked with Stephen Quadras Savage back in Dog. the day Savage Dog show uh, that was a cool song that they had uh, oh, the the intro theme? Yeah, yeah like my uh, good friend Postal did that. Uh, I, I still do. Yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's a rapper in Philly. He's been giving me crap this week about the Vikings and Eagles like it's nobody's <laughs> business. Um, but, yeah, so, like, uh, the Sure Dog Radio Network. I mean, still live. I still do a show for Sure Dog once a week. Uh, I just put up a, a roundtable today. Um, so I still technically work for Sure Dog. Unfortunately, it's uh, not my full-time job. You know, they, they're going through changes and changing things up. But, you know, Sure Dog is still every bit of who I am. And, uh, you know, it's, it's family and it's, a, it's, it's made me who I am today. Um, but, yeah, it's not, it's not what it once was. And that's, you know, unfortunate for me. It's, it's sad for me. Um, sure Dog has been my life. I've had two jobs really in my entire life. I work for a radio station in Minneapolis and Sure Dog for 12 years. I mean, I've been with Sure Dog as long as I've been with my wife. You know, like literally uh, just a couple months apart. Sure so Dog was the mistress and your wife was the wife. Uh, yeah, yeah. My wife might tell you that Sure Dog was the wife and she was she my was mistress, mistress because I was I was in the studio more than I was at home. Um, yeah, so uh, it's opened up a lot of doors for me. I uh, still produce Bruce Buffer's podcast, uh, a professional wrestling podcast that we do called The Lapsed Fan, which is about wrestling from 20 years ago, which is nuts. It's insane. I love it. You worked with Kenny and John, Yeah, too, right? I did Anakin and Florian until they went over to Fox. And yeah. then when Fox uh, took them over, they kind of took over production. Is your goal to be like a podcast one where you're the producer and you're doing nah, a bunch of nah. podcasts? My, my job is to work and make money and support my family. I don't – that's that's it. Like, I have a limited set of skills. I can produce radio. Uh, I can broadcast fairly well. I won't embarrass anybody if I'm sitting in the booth. Uh, knock on wood. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's all I want. I mean, I just want to work. That's it. Mm -hmm. When – 
Rampage called you back and called you an asshole. What did you do? Did you just stay oh, quiet it was and voicemail? Like voicemail. I didn't answer. Oh, yeah, when he okay. called me back, I'm like, oh my god, why is he calling me back? Because <laughs> he, he had said he, I think he was on Ryan Bennett's show and said, uh, yeah, I got this free phone where incoming calls are free. So I'm mm-hmm. like, well, why are you spending money calling me back to call me an asshole? Like, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so yeah, it was it was funny. Did you remind him that he had called you the asshole when you did the interview? Years or? later, yeah. years later, I did. Uh, the, actually, the last interview uh, when Jeff uh, left Sure Dog, uh, we had Quentin on, and I, I told him then. So it was kind of full circle. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. I always ask the in studio guests if they could share a good street fight story. You have one? Oh, I've been in one street fight, sort of. Um, so I did overnight radio, and I was going into a, a service station. And uh, this is in the mean streets of Minneapolis. Yes, okay. yes, the mean, mean streets of Murderapolis. Uh, walked in to get you know the the needs, the essentials for an overnight shift, which was Mountain Dew and energy drinks and like a Seven Eleven gummy bears. Yeah, yeah. So I got that, and as I was walking in, there were these two guys that were pushing each other around, and there was a girl there, and I don't know what they were doing. I didn't really pay attention, uh, but as I came out, one guy was like, "Yeah," he was looking at her too, and pointed at me, and I'm like, "What <laughs> are you talking about?" And he, the, the guy that uh, he was talking to came up to me and kind of like pu- puffed his chest out like that. And I had I'd been training for like three or four months, and I did the worst sloppiest double leg ever in the history of mankind. I thought he was going to punch me, so I just I instinctively shot in on him. I picked him up. I dumped him on his shoulder. He fell on like the, like the bump of the curb, like when you walk Ooh, into. Oh wow. Yeah, and then I looked at him. He was in pain. His buddy or his enemy, I don't know what the other guy was to him, just kind of looked at me like, oh, shit. And then I ran to my car and called my dad crying. Because mm. I was like, uh, I'm on video. I think I broke this dude's shoulder. They're going to call the police. They're going to get me at the radio station. Yeah, my dad's no. like, shut up. My dad was like a full-on biker, like full sleeve tattoos, <laughs> looked like Rob Zombie. Shut He's up. like, stop being <laughs> such a uh, – not my kid. Like, I mean, I, he passed away. I inherited four Harleys. Wow. Yeah, they're, they're just sitting in Minnesota. I yeah. actually have a clip from that night if you want to hear it. I'm all jacked up on Mountain Dew. That's I think true. that's the post fight yeah. interview. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not enough tears, though, so unfortunately. So nothing happened, huh? You got away with it? Yeah. Nobody yeah. found you? No, no. I, th- I think okay. that's self defense. So you're 1 0. Uh, it is 1 0. I think, right. I mean, I think there's a violation of the space, and, you know, right. who knows? Maybe someone could argue that you're not supposed to strike anyone at all or whatever. But, yeah, I think that little violation of the space, I mean, Late at night, there's two know. of them. It terrified me, yeah. 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 I was right. supposed to fight one time um, in Minnesota in the unregulated. That days, I like think I, I remember. Said. Yeah, like I said, I, uh, I trained with this fight team. And before too long, you ended up in a barn fighting somebody. Holy shit, I remember yeah. this. Yeah. And, uh, what happened? In so, uh, do you guys remember Sam Morgan? He was on season yeah. two of The Ultimate Fighter. Uh, he was supposed to fight a guy from the Militich camp in this bar in Owatonna, Minnesota. Um, I think Travis Fulton put on the show. And uh, there was some sort of discrepancy. Miracle, he wasn't fighting on it. <laughs> uh, generally, he did fight on those same shows. Got like 400 uh, fights. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes he would show up to the venue with his opponent. They would ride together. Yeah. That's not a joke. <laughs> um, like Hacksaw and, and the Iron Sheik? Yeah, yeah pretty I much. Know. Pretty much. And uh, there was some sort of discrepancy about what Sam was going to get paid. So Sam pulled out, and then the other sort of FU to the promoter was, well, we're not going to let this other kid fight. Um, which I was fine with. Uh, the guy I was supposed to fight was named Sean Nolan. Um, if you look him up in the Fight Finder, I think he's 4 and 42. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. And I would have outweighed him by like 20 pounds. And yeah, been, I remember yeah. hearing that you were training for it. And yeah. And I yeah. think you had lost some weight for it. You had your proper camp going. Yeah, this is a long this is, this Savage is before. Savage was talking about Nah, this is before Sure Dog. This is before, oh, before Sure Dog. Yeah, this is oh, inside fighting days. I lost a ton of weight while working at Sure Dog. Uh, I lost like 80 pounds. Okay. Gained like 30 back. But, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, this was 2004, uh, July of 2004. I was supposed to fight Sean Nolan. So, Let me fire off some rapid fires. Sure. Uh, uncomfortable interviews with fighters, you know, where either you got hung up on, cussed out. Similar to like what you said to Rampage, you know, years gone by, you can talk about it. Um, Matt Horwich is the most socially awkward per- person I've ever met in my life. You know, <laughs> he's the king of the word awesome. Uh, yes. Um, what happened there? So SureDog had this period where we didn't have credentials to the UFC, and we had yeah. to run around with video cameras, and we were the fat guys in the lobby trying to make money off fighters. <laughs> and uh, one time, I think it was in Chicago, Matt Horwich fought, and uh, he had me come up to his room, 
And uh, I was interviewing him, and he was trying to tell me what he was trying to set up. He lost that night, but he was trying to tell me what he was trying to set up in rubber guard. And he's like, put down the camera and come here. So he's like, he wants me to get on his bed and get in his rubber guard. And I'm like, <laughs> what are we doing right now? Uh, yeah. Was anyone else present? No, no. Oh, wow. Yeah, I used to go to events. So uh, you actually did yeah. go in the rubber guard? Uh, I mean, kind of. <laughs> I, I, I kind of half committed. Yeah, okay. I mean, he had, it was like an omoplata position that he was looking for, so mm. I wasn't like fully in his rubber guard, <laughs> but yeah. The camera was rolling? No, no, oh, no, okay. no. I wasn't going to let that leak out anywhere. <laughs> no, thank you. I would have been like the guy on South Park with the camera. Like, I would have felt better <laughs> if it would have been on the floor, but he wanted to do it on his bed. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah. That's pretty good. This is happening now. That is a pretty good story. Yeah. yeah um, yeah, what about confrontations? Um, let's see here. Hey, I didn't like what you said about me. You know, like that type of thing. <sighs> I don't know if I want to tell the story. He's still kind of mad at me. Um, Active fighter? Yeah, yeah. I mean, why not? I'll tell the story. Because <laughs> I, I actually want to make amends to it because like, I don't right. understand it. So um, Cub Swanson did an interview with oh, myself we can help and, you out. and we Jeff can help Sherwood. You out there, yeah. And uh, Cub was talking about his fight with Aldo. And he said that... Uh, uh, the knee, the flying knee. Yeah, the easy. Okay. yeah. He's like, he, he said that uh, my brother could have beat him that night. And he meant my brother could have beat the version of him, Cub thought that he was just not in the right place that night and anybody could have beat him. Cub was saying his own his brother, own brother could, could have beat, beat him. Cub Swanson. Okay. And uh, the editor that was assigned to uh, do a radio write-up took him at his word. Jeff and I knew what he was saying. We knew that he didn't mean Cub Swanson's brother could beat up Jose Aldo. Okay, But the technically, the way he said it, uh, word for word, that is what he said, and they wrote up an article about it. And Cub was really upset. You know, it didn't really make sense. It made him look silly. Yeah. Um, so we had. Uh, I, I asked the editor to write a retraction. Um, he didn't want to. Uh, so then we had Cub come on the air and basically set the record straight. And then we did a write up on Cub setting the record straight. Uh, but after that, he still would never talk to me. Oh wow! Mm, yeah. He's pretty level-headed. Like, yeah, yeah, I yeah. wonder what irked him. Who knows? I don't know. I mean, uh, we, we've just, if it makes you feel better, we've had that happen recently. And it usually happens about three or four times a year where it's say, eh, that's not what I said, you know, whatever. Right. And I would say 95% of the time it's like, yeah, that is what you yeah. said. But the most recent one was one where I agreed with the fighter and said, yeah, you're right. There was no indication of that. And so, you know. Yeah, I mean we're all grown men, and right. people say what what needs to be said, and and uh, I, I trust our writers and editors and everything. But you know, like I said, uh, I understood on on this one yeah. w way more than the other. And, and afterwards, you did pretty much everything you could do. Yeah, to I mean, the situation. I don't think Jeff or I really did anything, you know, poorly. And I, I really don't even blame the editor for what he did because technically that was the quote. But it, it was a bit of a misunderstanding. Jeff and I, I think, we're on the same page. It's like one of those things you just kind of had to be there. You know what I mean? Like, I know that Cub Swanson's not on here saying that his brother could have beat Jose Aldo that night, but he just happened to lose to him. I mean, come on. Jose was still a, the champion at that time, you know, greatest featherweight of all time at, at that point. So, uh, yeah, it is what it is. But, I mean, people are sensitive. It's a live microphone environment. Things happen. We need to have these stories anyway, because otherwise, what fun would it be if every day was, like, Perfect. Right. You know, there has to be some adversity, yeah. and and um, I'll take the perfect days. Will you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some of these fighters gonna be scary. I know. I know. I know. Uh, I had to once go into Extreme Couture and mm. the late Sean Tompkins. Yeah. Oh. You know, he was doing a one on one with someone, and he saw me walking up, and he was just glaring at me. But I, uh, I just figured the best way was mono and mono. You know, like yeah. Okay. You know, and this is our side, and this is what you're thinking, or whatever. But it was kind of cool to leave with a handshake. Sure. You know, the okay, I see what happens, or whatever. Um, you gain respect that way. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, if you duck out the back door and never talk to him again, it's going to be awkward forever. He's going to probably have less respect for you. You know what I mean? Like, when you meet things head on, like, you know, general respect, I think, is gained and formed. Yeah, and I forget what movie was, was one of those L.A. gang movies, but I, I think I said the same thing. As I was walking to him, if I get dealt with, I get dealt with. Oh, it's Friday. Doesn't Smokey say that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, he says right. that he goes, all right, you know, if I get dealt with, I get dealt with. Mm -hmm. And um, and and Sean, man, pretty frightening guy, man. He's pretty big, incredible striker, great coach. He uh, we had a great relationship with him. He, ever, uh, ever after after that, before that, it was yeah. just you know one little misunderstanding and. 
Yeah. He uh, he rolled through Minnesota one time in one of those like barn shows that we had and had uh, this kid named Sonny Leong who has like the most upside down record. Wait, a minute. Wait isn't that a porn star? No, 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 no. <laughs> Sonny Leong is a. Uh, I'm not going to say his nickname because I'm, I'm not going to say his nickname. Okay. But, uh, look him up on the Fight Finder. He uh, he's the most intense like uh, sub 500 fighter I've ever seen in my life, and I thought he was going to kill the dude that he fought, and he ended up getting arm barred. But like I, I got to see Sam Stout fight a kid named uh, Joey Clark. And I think this is 2004, maybe early 2005. And I remember Sam Stout telling us uh, the Tompkins conditioning routine. This is long before anyone knew who Team Tompkins was. Uh, like the, the, the only real notable guy from that camp at that time was Mark Hominick, who was doing big things in UCC, which turned into TKO. And Stout was talking about how uh, they ran five miles for a warm-up. Whoa. And I'm just like, this is insane. And... Uh, yeah, like I remember those guys coming through. Christoph Shashinsky fought on that card. Huh. He's a big Hordesky blown up there? heavyweight. What's that? Hordesky. Uh, Hordesky was a, yeah. He was probably like in it's elementary like school. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it was it was pretty nuts to kind of like it, it, the the Midwest. Like these these guys came from all over the place. And uh, you yeah. sure it was Sonny Leon? Leong, Leong, L E O N G. Cause they fought, they fought a guy even this, the porn star Sunny Leon, she was at the Super nah, Fight League. So <laughs> when I pulled it up, league. yeah, because I think she has an Indian heritage, and so she was actually at the Super Fight League, which is a former MMA um, productions. Sunny Leon, oh, that's okay, great. yeah, Sunny Leon, I got him here, sure dog. Hmm. All right. Well, maybe you can. Oh, there, that might be him. Yeah, there <laughs> it is. A lot of red in his fight finder. He's one in twelve. Uh, probably right. Nickname's not there though. It's not. I'll tell you later. Right. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Um. And so that kind of does it for. So other than that, it's been a, a pretty smooth ride for you. Then. Yeah. 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 I'm not. I'm not a controversial guy. I don't bait people into questions or anything. What about like that. journalists? Have you ever beefed with other journalists or just like Josh Gross has made my life a living hell for the last <laughs> 15 years? But yeah, no, I love Josh. Uh, I still work with Josh. I produce his podcast with. Uh, Jeff Sherwood, which is on Patreon, called The Outsiders, which is cool. A lot of old school stories. No, I don't really not get along with anybody. Yeah, I mean, cool. if I uh, if anybody said anything bad about me or I say something bad about them, generally it's just hammed up radio shit. You know what I mean? It's not like a big thing. Yeah. A lot of the old school stories get recycled and you hear them over and over. But what's like the last old school story that you'd never heard that kind of brightened up your day? Um... Have you guys heard the story about Josh Gross and, and Boss Rudin in Japan and Boss got hit by like a minivan? <laughs> no. Yeah, like no. this isn't my story. It's been told to me r many times, but apparently Gross and, and Rudin were hanging out in Japan and, uh, you know, they were feeling pretty good, drinking whatever they were drinking, and uh, they go to cross the street and apparently Boss looks the wrong way. He's going to drive on the other side of the street oh, there. That's right. He looks at the wrong way, steps out, gets hit by a minivan, goes flying up in the air lands gross is like oh my god i just watched boss root and die and boss gets up picks up whatever fell out of his pockets like let's go <laughs> Damn. yeah how's the truck that right yeah exactly <laughs> exactly but uh, i mean that's not my for story for some reason i feel like i may have heard something like that but no i'm reacting to it like this is the first time because yeah. uh, it probably is yeah the story that gets recycled again not my story but it, did you guys hear about greg savage and jeff sherwood being in Miami for UFC 42 and with Josh like Thompson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that story's been told a million Pretty times, but every time I hear Jeff or Greg tell that story, I'm just like, oh my god, this is ridiculous. Yeah, no, I've heard that one. All right, we may have you retell it though, if you know it. I don't know the whole entire story, other than Josh Thompson was was starting some crap, right. I believe, and things escalated. Apparently, like a couple of guys turned into like seven guys, and then they were running up and down the street yeah. and they got cornered and. Uh, Sherwood's fighting somebody. Savage says that he saved Jeff by hitting some dude over the head with like a plastic lawn chair that was like outside of the mm. patio. Yeah, it just I don't know. This is this is crazy that this is happening the same weekend that there's a major UFC. You know, it's the media and the fighters fighting together in a roundabout way. It's like what is happening? Right. Well, yeah. Everybody knew each other. Everybody yeah. still knows each other. The sport will start to separate like that, and it'll be like the big four and the other sports that are out there, but that's what's unique about this sport. Again, if we had come 50 years later, we'd read about these stories and react to them, the way you react to Babe Ruth getting drunk and pointing to center field. I mean, th things that, yeah. you know, you just don't hear about as much now. But, all right, we got to take this break. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on SiriusXM Rush 93. We have TJ DeSantis in the house.
left. We still have some time left here before we bounce for the week. So holler at us if you want to give us some last-minute predictions at uh, on the Bellator 192 cards, UFC 220 cards. If you have a question, if you have a take, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's 866-522-2846. We'll be right back.
Hey, idiot! Yeah, you! Can you please tap that rather large fellow on the shoulder and tell him it's time for more MMA Junkie Radio with Gorgeous George and Goes? Thank you! Sirius XM is giving our subscribers the chance to win an opportunity to go to Minneapolis, Minnesota for Super Bowl 52. One grand prize winner will receive a trip or two, including airfare, three nights, hotel stay, and two tickets to Super Bowl 52. This takes place on February 4th, and it's in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And if you're a football fan, this is the ultimate prize. No additional purchase necessary. For official rules and to enter, go to SiriusXM.com forward slash Super Bowl. Do that before January 24th, 2018. The NFL entities, as defined in the official rules, have not offered or sponsored this sweepstakes in any way. That's a cool pick, man. Yeah. Yeah, your dad, dad had some swag. Yeah, he looked like Rob Zombie. Yeah. Yeah. Chill. Hey, I brought up the Vikings. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Let's take this call from New Zealand, and then I want to get your reaction to the Vikings because what happened last Sunday was something I've never seen before it's in a football game. Broadcast. Ben from New Zealand. What's <laughs> up, Ben? How you been? I've been sweet, Gigi. This is really uh, worlds colliding here because I've listened to a million TJ shows. I've listened to a million janky radio shows. So having you guys all on the same thing, this is uh, making my week. Thank you. Yeah, you know, and again, a big t- thanks to TJ for driving out from L.A. to, to for doing this. Uh, thanks again, my TJ. My pleasure, man. man. This has really been it's fun. Awesome. We had a great breakfast earlier, uh, you know, com- comparing stories and talking about the past. So it's really been a fun morning for us. Well, here's, uh, here's what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm at today. This weekend, um, Stipe is going to be the first uh, heavyweight to try and defend the UFC title more than twice, right? Correct. And the other UFC title, which has a record of being insanely hard to build a run off, is the lightweight belt. And these two, these two divisions are almost like on opposite ends of, say, the, the talent pool stakes because lightweight, as uh, Frank Mir once explained to us on this very show, lightweight is the deepest division because the average athletic Brazilian slash American man is about five nine, five ten, about one seventy pounds. You know, so it's cutting down to one fifty five. So lightweight, well, more like five ten, two fifty. Yeah, I, I hear Something you. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> but then heavyweight, of course, is at the other end, and is not only short on talent pool in general, but also you, we lose a lot of uh, the big, bigger talent to the big money sports. So, and yet either side of these things, we've got just. One side of, light, of heavyweight, we've got John Jones has made a massive, impressive run at light heavyweight, which is not far away. And on the other sides of the bell curve from lightweight, just the one either side, George St. Pierre at welterweight and Jose Aldo at featherweight in these super deep divisions made these awesome runs. So what is it about lightweight and heavyweight, if anything? I mean, this might just be randomness, statistical randomness. Is there any sort of unified idea of why these two belts, the heaviest, maybe the shallowest division and the deepest division, have the titles which are the hardest to build a run off. Okay. For the heavyweights, it's the power. And for the lightweights, it's the depth. Uh, to, to get a title shot, you have to be on. Remember when Jim Miller had eight wins in a row and he still couldn't get a title shot? And then he loses a fight, and then, oh, what do you know, he lost three of the next four? I mean, it's just ultra competitive. So that's if I had to just make it simple, I'd say lightweight is stacked. It's just tough to stay on a run. And heavyweight, just that power, man. You have to be, you have to be on point, you know. Otherwise, someone will crack you. Like, remember when uh, Randy Couture was chess matching? He had a chess match against Brock, and Brock's punch didn't hit the chin or the liver or anything. It, he just clipped him in the back, and yeah, yeah. you know, but it was so much power. Randy wasn't able to get his equilibrium back, and that was the end of, you know, uh, the beginning of the end, I should say. Uh, you guys care to chime in on the lightweight? lightweight uh, yeah, er- everyone knows I'm like a big champion of the lightweight division as far as like favorite weight class. It's what got me into the sport. But like George said, it's it's like it's a volatility versus talent spectrum. Obviously, talent being lightweight division, your average human beings. And uh, and personally, I actually like the history there kind of better. It makes you know it makes stuff like guys like BJ Penn look even cooler in retrospect. The fact that the UFC officially tried and failed three times to make what is the deepest division now. Think about it. Think about how deep that roster's been, and it, it took them. We're on, we're on our fourth try still, technically, for the UFC of our lightweight, lightweight division. Think about that. That's insane. You go into the heavyweight factor of things. Would we be having this conversation? If Cain Velasquez wasn't as prone That's to injury as he's been, yeah. and also because yeah. he yeah. looked like the type of guy yeah. that just was unsolvable, right? With the exception of we had to take him to eight thousand feet of altitude, you know, and, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Um, but that's just it. He, he wasn't, and um, ever since then, that you know, 
no one's really been as consistent as Stipe. So him getting past Ngannou is going to be huge for him going forward. Like I, you can almost say the next two or three may be uh, easier, easier tasks. Who knows? Who knows who, who it'll be by the time he gets to them. All right, but thank you for calling all the way from New Zealand at 4 a.m. I love this guy. Dang, ben, asleep, yeah. Ben from New Zealand, yeah. <laughs> How was your reaction? I know you're not hardcore. You're not doing, you know, the, the right. what's that called? Skull. Yeah, you're not doing yeah. all that. But I still, can sing you the theme song I, if you I, want. I think you're you're proud of your yeah. team. Uh, you've been through a lot. We were discussing this earlier. But still, you said it didn't bring you to tears, but, but you had a smile on your face. But I can be a fan again. I'm the only game a fan. Was, the game was amazing. The ending yeah. was a, a classic. Like I was watching Inside the NFL, and those guys were shaking. Like yeah. Ray Lewis and Boomer, they are like, God, man, it was – because they were, you know, NFL Films captures, like, people like Everson Griffin, who just, he, he didn't know how to react. He couldn't believe <laughs> it. He wanted to pinch himself. There was people in the full Vikings attire, yeah. you know, face painted that tears are coming down their eyes, you know. And Drew Brees, he's 39 years old, so he's seen it all. He has nothing to do but just walk across and shake hands. I mean, it was something else. It's the third greatest moment in Minneapolis sports. And if the Vikings go on to win a Super Bowl, it'll probably be number one or number two. Uh, the only thing that surpasses it, uh, the 1991 World Series. Oh. Kirby Puckett hits yeah. a walk-off home run. Now game what's six. two? Wait, don't tell us two yet. Let's guess. Can you guess what Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota? Number two. The North Stars, I guess. Uh, Timberwolves haven't done shit. I mean, they made it to a conference championship. Kevin Garnett leaving. <laughs> Prince playing <laughs> the Super Bowl. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I mean, what's number two? It's, it's not fair. Number two is is also from uh, the '91 World Series, and it's Kirby Puckett. Oh. He he has a game saving uh, home run catch in center okay. field. Um, the '91 series is the greatest World Series of all time. Uh, Atlanta Braves fans will tell you that, and and they lost that year. So um, I don't know. For me, I've seen the Vikings in this position over and over and over again. '98, we were 15 and one. Gary Anderson flawless for the last how many ever kicks. 35-yard field goal to send the Falcons home and wide left. Um, you know, in 2009, we have Brett Favre. We get a 12 men on the field penalty, uh, which kind of ruined our momentum. And then uh, Favre uh, throws an interception across his body, just the most ill-advised throw ever. He runs seven yards. He gets first down. There's no one in front of him. Um, they're the most embarrassing. Blair Walsh. Yeah, Blair that? Walsh a couple years Oof. ago against the he Seahawks. Oof, they, that one was tough. That was even closer than uh, an extra point. They're, they're incredibly, incredibly cursed off the field as well. They had the whole charter a boat thing, and, and you know, scandalous ladies were on the, the boat with them, and they're doing really bad things in front of, like, families that are trying to enjoy lunch. Uh, there's a guy named Ontario lunch. Smith. Yeah, it was, like, in the middle of the day. The, the middle of the day. Um... <laughs> Ontario Smith was, uh, I think, a running back for the Vikings. He got busted for using a Wizenator because he was trying to get around testing positive for marijuana. Yeah, like, I don't know, just thing after thing after thing where the Vikings look silly. And uh, so I fully expect a collapse uh, coming up on Sunday. But uh, I figure I'll just naysay them all the way to a Super Bowl championship. I mean, th like, destiny says they should win. The Super Bowl is in Minneapolis. Like, to me, everything's going to work so well for them. Oh, and then we're the just going to find out something terrible. Brokers are making a lot of money because people mm. feel like that could happen. Right. And so based off that win, apparently these tickets, the market went up really, really high. That's funny. What's the most you'd pay for a Super Bowl ticket? Oh, man. If the uh, Vikings were to make it. I don't know. Like I, like I said, like I have this really love – like I'm I'm snake bitten by this team. Like they have to win a Super Bowl for me to go buy a, a jersey. I don't think I'd buy a Super Bowl ticket. I really wouldn't. You know what? If the Red Sox could shake off what they did, yeah. I'm sure you guys can shake it off too. And you have a great D. And the quarterback's been not bad, man. Now, he did right. get hurt a little bit. Yeah. They, they hit him hard the other yeah. day. Keenum, he yeah. got hit. But he um, that throw was savage, and he kept them in there. You know, I I, I wouldn't want to be the starting quarterback and know I got to – it's going to come probably come down to me outperforming Breeze. Breeze is a stud. You know, but again, great D. I don't know. We'll see what happens. I'm not a huge NFL fan, though, either. Like, I really love college football. College football, to me, is – probably the greatest sport next to mixed martial arts. Um, the problem with, like, and, and again, I'm snake bitten by the Vikings, but at, like, week six, if you're one and five, you're no longer a football team. You're a bunch of rich assholes trying not to get hurt for the rest of the season. And it's hard for me to stick through that. Baseball I can stick through because a lot of guys are, you know, trying to get their stat lines up and, and continue. But, like, I can't watch football if it's a losing season. It's it's difficult for so me. So, we'll see, we're Trojan fans, so we don't really experience the one and five. We don't 
well, I'm the yeah, five and yeah, one. Yeah. I'm talking the NFL. We're usually six and zero by then. I mean, I'll, I, I'm a fan of the Iowa Hawkeyes. I'll watch. You know, if oh, really? You're not a Gophers fan? No, oh. no. My wife went to the University of Iowa. My radio station that I worked for was on the University of Minnesota, and those guys just jaywalked and almost made me kill them on a regular basis. So that was enough for me to not like the Gophers. <laughs> what made you come out, by the way? Just the cold or uh, sure dog? dog? Okay, yeah, sure dog. Because you could produce from anywhere. And I yeah. thought when we were in. No, Goes wasn't with me, but when we were in Min- uh, Cincinnati mm-hmm. for UFC 77, I was talking to Savage one day or someone, and they had said that Sure Dog had built you a $20,000 studio in your home or something. Uh, so I, I figured that was just going to be your home yeah, for my, a long time. My dad had put about fifteen grand into his studio before he passed away. Oh, not Sure Dog. Not Sure Dog. Okay. Um, so that's, that's why uh, I'm in the position that I'm in today. Like everything that I've used to produce Sure Dog and, and everything else, it's mine. I own it. I've upgraded the equipment. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm an audio snob. Um, it's bad. I pick. I'm nitpicky. Like, don't listen to podcasts with me because I'll start. Just are we all right? Or we do, do we need new mics? I know we, we're hurting a little bit this, over there. This headset's been a little bit of an issue. Has it? Yeah, okay. yeah. It's all right. It's all right. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no. So uh, I built that studio. Uh, it had originally started in my parents' garage, and then uh, I bought a house, put it in my house, and then uh, when we moved out here, I put it in Crave's uh, studio area and. Had to take that out recently, and I'm actually moving into a new place tomorrow, which is super exciting. So, Now, I'm not the biggest women's MMA fan. However, let me explain. I feel like in every division, there's about half dozen to about a dozen great fighters. Mm-hmm. And then I feel like there's this big drop-off. Right. Now, with every year, there's new uh, fighters to stock the shelves. And so in about a year, I'll probably say it's like 8 to 18, sure. and then eventually they'll fill out. It hasn't for me. But you call Invicta fights. Tell me what I'm missing, you know, when I'm just kind of tuning in for the the um, the feature fight, the co-main and the right. main. Are, are, are is, has it started coming up, the level of competition in, you know, the, those, uh, the first couple prelims? Sure. Do you like mixed martial arts? Yeah. Okay. You don't have to even have the most talented fighters in the world to have a good fight. And I think Invicta does a really good job at, at matchmaking. They have talented fighters that are coming up, and, and they're, they're grooming them very, very well. Okay. So if you're a fan of mixed martial arts, I think you should watch mixed martial arts no matter what. What hooks people at Invicta is Shannon Knapp and her development team find really good amateurs and give them the opportunity to shine, and all of a sudden four or five fights into their Invicta run, they're fighting for the UFC. Yeah, they did it with Aspen Lad, yeah. who tough enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, Shannon is also, re- like you mentioned, t- uh, tough enough. Shannon has done a really good job making relationships with other promoters, like, like tough enough, uh, Pancrase, Jules in the past. Um, you know, th- there's always an opportunity. That's what, what Shannon really wants to provide for these athletes. And um, I would say you should tune in no matter what. Like the first ever Invicta fight I called was in Los Angeles, and it was Aspen Lad. Right. You know, that was the first fight. I called her Angela for like the first two minutes. I didn't have much time to prep for that show. But, uh, yeah, so, like, you never know who's going to go. I think and maybe it was because they don't have as much of the threat of the knockout as with the ma- their male counterparts. Uh, who knows? Now, that said, it's I love the straw weights on top. Right. I was glued to every, right. you know, uh, and, and I guess, I don't know. I think it's something else, man, because, like, you don't only watch MMA for knockouts. You don't. And I've seen knockouts at 115 pounds. I, Olivia Souza, who's in the UFC now, she knocked out Ayaka Hamasaki badly. Badly. That's at 115 pounds. I like, you're going to see fighters that have power knock people out at 105 pounds. It's going to happen. It's getting better. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that there's any reason. If you, like Vince McMahon was going to start a mixed martial arts league uh, a while ago, like probably 2003 to 2004. And he, uh, do you know who Rick Bassman is? Southern California uh, MMA slash professional wrestling promoter. And Rick was like his... Uh, confidant to tell him what he should do and and this is when the WWE was flirting with buying pride and uh, Rick was like don't buy pride don't spend all this money on the world's greatest fighters you know how to brand you know how to market what you need to do is you need to get lower level fighters who are polarizing individuals and match them up accordingly because you can have a great fight with two evenly matched fighters even if they don't have technique I believe in that yeah and you know ultimately Vince didn't get in that business but that's the best thing about mixed martial arts it can be 
two fighters that have never fought before. Some of the best fights I've ever seen were two farm boys in the Midwest that were both 170 pounds and threw like it was their last day on earth. You know what I mean? Was it technical? No. Was it uh, what I love about mixed martial arts in a roundabout way? Yes. I like to know who the best fighter in the world is, but I like a good fight, and you can have a good fight with anybody. we got to take our last break. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius XM Rush 93. We'll take one more call, 866-522-2846. And uh, give our final predictions and then bounce out of here and call it a week. We'll be right back with TJ DeSantis in the house as a co-host today. They can drink Mentos-flavored Diet Coke without their stomachs giving a single fuck. They are gorgeous George and Goes. And this is MMA Chunky Radio. Start your day with SiriusXM. Enable the SiriusXM skill on your Amazon device. Then tell Alexa to set an alarm for your favorite channel, and you'll wake up to the sounds of SiriusXM. With SiriusXM and Alexa, you can get the latest sports news each morning without picking up your phone or turning on the TV. All right, Tony's out. I think Dan's calling in from Oregon. Let me just do this little quick sweep of the uh, thanking the guests for the week so we can gracefully bow out to the SiriusXM audience, and then we're going to do a couple minutes of overtime. So thank you very much to Chris Cyborg, Stephen Thompson, Darren Elkins, Steve Cofield, Vince Pichel, Andre Feely, Frank Camacho, Matt Brown, and TJ DeSantis. Uh, next week, not much cooking just yet that I can put out there, although uh, Jess Clark, who just fought, uh, she beat Paige Van Zandt. She'll be our co-host on Wednesday. So definitely looking forward to that. And uh, parlays. All right. Uh, this is what I put together. I'll lead off. Miocic. So I filled my underdog role. Mm -hmm. It's always good to have an underdog if you want to risk little and win a lot. If you take a bunch of favorites, you're just going to make twenty, make 60 off a $20 bet. I like to make 200 off a $20 bet if possible. Cormier, which kind of hurts my odds. But... I'm going to ride with him, Miocic, and my other guy is Burgos. All right. What do you think of that? Say it again. Miocic, who, and Burgos? Cormier, Miocic, Cormier. and okay. Burgos. My 
120 should pay 120, except I got two favorites, so it'll probably be 20 to win 100 if I had to guess. Uh, I'd be, st I'm staying away from that heavyweight fight because it's it's super volatile, and also, I, I think my advice is try to make your plays without the main event, especially if it's a volatile fight. That way, you can just enjoy it, not have any money on it. But uh, my betting, uh, I'll go Bur Burgos, Cormier, and Ige for a dog to be fun. But by the way, just real quick, my real betting stuff, my betting article that usually drops today will drop tomorrow. But my main card article drops today. In fact, I've had breakdowns every day this week dropping on MMAJunkie.com in case you want to go check those out. Also, for the Serious XM audience, you can follow TJ DeSantis on Twitter at TJ DeSantis. Patreon.com forward slash between rounds. I got to get that in yeah, there. Yeah, anything that's, else? Yeah, uh, no, that's pretty good. Patreon.com. Right. Yeah, when's the next Invicta show? Uh, March, March, I think. I don't know if they have a date or a right. city yet. And then uh, you can catch them on EBI, Invicta, yeah. Tachi Palace. Shirto.com. I still do beat down. Yeah, uh, and in fact, I want to ask you about uh, Patreon. So we'll, we'll continue with sure. a couple minutes of OT. We'll get Goza's parlay, TJ's parlay, if he has one. Hopefully do. he does. And uh, take a couple more calls. So for the Series 6 m audience, if you're wondering about the OT, you know, once you're pulled over, if you ever want to check it out, it's Facebook.com forward slash official MMA Junkie or YouTube.com forward slash MMA Junkie Video. The rest of you have a nice weekend. And anybody wants to catch the overtime, give us about 10, 15 seconds. And we'll be right back. I'm gonna have me some fun It cost me my very last game Get my wife a broke over well, I'll always remember that I had a swing in time You guys are clear for overtime Alright, give us those parlays, guys What do you have? I got the champ, Stipe Miocic mm -hmm. Parlay to Thomas Almeida mm -hmm. Parlay to Dan Ike Mm. He went all volatile. Jeez. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, <laughs> he, he most volatile fights listed. Extreme couture guy, so he's, yeah. he's backing them there. Okay. TJ, who do you like? I'm slow here to figure out what it would actually pay, but uh, I like Cormier, uh, John Volante to beat France Marbar Hose. Nice. Um, Volante is largely underperformed. I think he's going to finally get something going here. And then uh, I like the hometown guy in Rob Font. Uh, to beat Thomas Almeida. That's going to be a really close fight uh, in those close fights mm -hmm. uh, in hometowns. Guys tend to get everything that they do uh, cheered for really loudly. So I'm thinking that the judges might be swayed a little bit. Maybe Font picks up a decision he doesn't necessarily even deserve, but uh, <laughs> that's what I like. So I can You guys are very similar. Your 20 will probably pay about 80 or 90, both of you. That's good. That's it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm well, good with that. I'm good have, with that. Do you have the. F well, you have Miocic, though, huh? Hang on. I'm, yeah. I'm going to give you a price here in a moment. Yeah. All mine are. Practically close to even. Yeah, he's got, he's yeah, got, Cormier, he's got two dogs. No, I don't. I have uh, Miocic, Almeida, and Ike. He took two dogs and a oh, close even uh, favor. Okay. That's okay. a Your 20 will pay about, if I had to guess, 170 ish. Okay, my uh, my 20 would pay out 80? Uh, 77.49. Okay. Yeah. I'm the worst, right. so I'm a chalk guy, GG. <laughs> my 20, I'll, I'll, pay, I'll pay 20 to. To take thirty if it's a uh, if it's just what two was favorites again? so that I'll have those dudes. Uh, the Cormier, Cormier, and who else? yeah, Cormier, Burgos, <laughs> and Dan Ige. Cormier, Burgos, and Dan Ige. You know, I've only made like one public bet ever, and I look like a genius. And that's when I said Tony Evinger would go over with Cyborg. Nice. I think it was like two and a half was the over or something like that. Ige's a dog. Easy money. Yep. Okay. Ige, Cormier, and Burgos. I Your been. twenty will pay about ninety-five. So, I have the best uh, first bet. I have the best first MMA bet story that I guarantee you that probably you or the callers can't 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 uh, top because my first MMA bet was that Forrest Griffin would beat Anderson Silva. <laughs> so imagine, wow. so ma for first bet and worst bet, like that's a hard one to beat, right? As far as that, like just sitting there, like all right, here we go, finally stepping up to this gambling MMA thing. Been watching for years. Is this the time? <laughs> <laughs> You're just like uh, you uh, could top geez. it if we had gone through with it. Wh wh who'd you bet? Um, <laughs> from uh, the judoka that fought Nogueira, Pride. Oh, uh, uh, so could you. So could you. At the oh, Caesar's Palace, no. and I go, look, it's plus 1600. Uh, yeah. And I think we were headed that way. What's the story? No, I ran into Dan Henderson the night before. And my buddy said, hey, is there anybody we should bet on? He goes, bet on my boy. So could you. He's, he's legit. So he goes, dude, we got to run and put Whoa. 100 bucks on him. And I go, every 
every guy says their right, buddy is yeah. legit. Like, yeah. why don't, wouldn't you feel better if we just bought $100 worth of Jack and went back to the room? And he was like, you're making sense. There you go. Dude, that's worse than the story here, that Clemson story. That's worse than that goes. I don't like to talk about it. Holy crap. Oh, dude, my you want to see something that's even trounces everybody else. Look at what my buddy sent me yesterday. Let's see if I can retrieve it. Let's <laughs> take these calls, and then we got to get out of here. Uh, Dan in Oregon, you're up. What's up, Dan? How you doing? What up? Yo, did, did you touch on apparently that dude that laid that bet on Nisha Tate is now betting on Nganu? That's what I heard around town. Vegas Dave? Yeah, I think so. I'm freaking Cofield or some account, sports account, that like Cofield was tweeting, was talking about it. Some 100 grand bet is out there on Nganu. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. You know, that might make Here sense for that little 20-cent bump because it was minus 200 yep. all week. I have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then this morning I walk in and it's 220. I just showed the guys a, a uh, ticket. It was $1,000, and it would have paid 29000 on the Saints' uh, money line. And the Vikings won Dude, on the last play. Dude, that's insane. So how maybe crazy maybe is that? that lifts the curse. Maybe someone <laughs> yeah. else feels the pain. Yeah, there you go. But you know what? Vegas Dave, if it's Vegas Dave, um... He, well, who knows? I don't know. I don't know who it is. And, I mean, good for him if he hits it, you know, whatever. My first MMA bet real quick, yes. Kenny Florian to beat or to lose to Kit Cope. Oh, and wow. I, and I end up producing Kenny's podcast. And, of course, I told him. And then he never let me live it down. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Dan? TJ, man, I'm glad to hear your voice again. Good luck to your Vikings this upcoming weekend. My <laughs> dad loves the color of the purple. Uh and uh, I am a Between Rounds Patreon member. I hope it's a nice, smooth in-between rounds, not some bullshit like Joel Romero and Stoolgate and all that nonsense. Um, <laughs> and the last thing to you guys, man. Shit. I forgot even what I was going to talk about. Uh, man, I'm picking Stipe. I'll give you my picks. I just... I, you, you go watch his JDS fight from the first one to the second one. I agree, or I scored the first one a draw. The second one, his improvement is insane. Go out and you watching these Stipe fights. Like he kind of came out and he was maybe a button smasher on the game, and I feel like he's got more IQ involved in in how he fights these days. But that JDS fight, man, he was taking low kicks like crazy on the calf, yes. that uh, mm -hmm. ATT kick. And I just saw that video of Ngannou taking out his freaking training guy during you know their little. Uh, fight thing, and so I, I don't know what's going to happen, and I'm rolling with DC. Give me uh, Sun in by Lay and Prey, and then I'll pick Rory Mac too, just because everyone's going to. Back to you guys, man. All right, see you, brother. So he's got Rory, DC, and Ganu, and Chael. So Top at least four. he does have one underdog. Yeah. Last call. Showtime. It's your time. Showtime. Hey, what's going on, fellas? Hey, I up? hate to, to bust my man bubble, but I'm a big time Eagles fan, man. And it, it just ain't gonna happen, man. The story is good. I Everything agree. Last week. <laughs> I agree. You know, story is good. I mean, I, I you know, I even sat there and was like, wow. But <laughs> you know, I just think that it, it's gonna come to an end this weekend, man. At, at home. What's the you score, know, Showtime? Our defense is good too. Showtime. What's the um, score gonna be? I think the Eagles, uh, twenty-one, twenty-four, Philly. Oh, so it's gonna be. All right. I think it's gonna be low scoring. Twenty-one. Isn't it gonna be raining? I think it's gonna be um, thirteen ten Minnesota. I don't have a prediction. Just a heartbreak. I'm going for Minnesota because uh, my brother-in-law, that part of the family, is all all from there. So they're they're all huge uh, Minnesota fans. So yeah. by default, I'll they're all Norwegian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> me <laughs> you know, too. You, you could tell. I mean, you could tell from me. It's yeah. it bleeds through. <laughs> Dude, clearly. I'm I'm fish belly white. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Showtime. Uh, do you have a parlay or anything? Yeah. Yeah, I do, man. I, um, ah. I like the the Barzola kid. Um, Read my I'm mind. taking Barzola. Yeah. I'm taking, uh, what is it, Makachev? Is that how you pronounce it? Yep, that's a good one. I'm taking Maybe. Al Hassan, Al Maida, and Boch Bochinet. I'm careful with that one. I know, I know, I know, but I, you know what? <laughs> I sat there and watched watched his fights, and I watched the other guys' fights, and the other guy will sit there and stand and trade, man. And I just think that, that Bozniak, I think that's the right guy for him to do that with. Yeah, he's got a and path, man. He's certainly got a path. I'm with you though on those uh, on the uh, 
uh, Barzolo. That, that's the one I'm, I'm investigating. I would have I would have came with it here for our little parlay contest, but he wasn't listed. But I like that Barzola play. Yeah, yeah. I, I like. I mean, that, the the heavyweight. The, I, oh, I like. I like DC as well. But as far as with the the heavyweight fight, man, I think I might stay away from that one, man. I like Stipe for the bet, but I just think it's not gonna happen, man. I just think he leaves his chin out there, and I think Engano can just barely graze that chin, and he can put you to sleep. So I'm, I think I'm gonna stay away from that one. All right, my man. Well, enjoy the fights and enjoy the games on Sunday. Thanks for the call. Have a nice weekend. Uh, okay, guys. All right. All right. Uh, let's leave with this. Uh, sh- uh, we've come across Patreon through talking to Josh and Jeff. I'm also a supporter of theirs uh, on that podcast. But talk about Patreon because I, I also saw Jack Encarnacion having some success with it as well yeah that's that's uh, my lapsed fan wrestling podcast that i do with jack oh, okay yeah yeah so um is this like a community that's you know gonna explode and yeah I, mean, I see there's a lot of shows that have done really really well i guess it's how much you market it or how much you're asking for right is it like yeah. wikipedia where sometimes you just walk in there and they go you know it'd be a lot easier if you give us three bucks how does that work, and, and what's what's that experience been like? I mean, it actually got me interested. Sure. I mean, it's up to you in how you want to use Patreon. For the Laps fan, we require nothing to listen. We don't ask the listener to do anything but the right thing, and that's give us their money for all the hard work that we do. I mean, the Laps fan, these guys broke into the Pontiac Silverdome on the 30th anniversary of WrestleMania three and reenacted Hogan's body slam of Andre the Giant. Like, they broke and entered, trespassed, and, yeah, crazy. I mean, they flew themselves to Pontiac. Like, the least you can do is give us $5. Um, Did they have that moving cart to bring in whoever was Andre? uh, Unfortunately, uh, the rubble that was on the field would not allow that. Um, But, yeah, no. So they they just asked people to basically, hey, give us a tip. You know, do the right thing. Support us. Um, Did it go well? Yeah, okay. like, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, because I like your mission statement. Um, I, I don't know how long ago you did it, but you're basically saying once, once that you do have more support, then yeah, maybe you'll you'll back off. So I mean, it, it's like it's a transition phase for you. You know what yeah, I mean? So I, I think it's I think it's a great thing because yeah. people uh, will be incentivized if they're a fan of you and your work, right. and they just know that now you need the resources because. Right now, there's nobody else out there that's that's giving you that type of backing. Then a lot of people get behind it. That's what I felt right. with yeah. Brian Bennett. I wanted to help him out. I knew right. that if my five bucks and others felt the same way, it could keep the, the lights on for the server yep. or allow them to travel and give us more shows. And it made you feel a part of it, too. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, like I told you, when you asked me what I want to do, like, I just want to work. And, you know, I lost, uh, I lost a full-time gig. I'm trying to replace that. Uh, the Patreon money... Uh, I don't keep all of it. We do roundtables for every event. Uh, the winner of the roundtable gets 100 bucks, so I part with that. Um, I pay Jeff Sherwood. You know, Jeff's uh, the closest thing to a brother uh, and, and a father that I have now that my dad's gone. Uh, so I, I help Jeff out. Uh, Jordan Breen's a huge contributor. We do a show on, uh, on Between Rounds that is similar to The Laps Fan, but it's mixed martial arts related. Uh, there's a lot of time and uh, prep that goes into that. Um, and then, you know, now I'm in a, a business park. I got to have a small business account with a internet service provider, which is 17,000 times more expensive than your at home service because you're a small business. So, uh, yeah, anything that people can give, like I, I give a lot of content away on between rounds as well. I want to make sure that people are listening. Um, and I feel like we haven't even got it going yet. Like I, I think we're going to get the Jordan Breen show, uh, up on Patreon again. And, and I want to do a show. Uh, you know, every other day or so, a call-in show, listener show, something like that, because this is what I've done for over a decade. I don't want to stop. I don't want to go sell cars. I've, I've never had a job that didn't involve a microphone. Like, literally, I pulled weeds one summer when I was 14. That's it. And, uh, you know, I don't know what it's like to go. I've never, I've never, I have one job interview in my life, you know, and uh, didn't get that gig. But, um, yeah, so I'm just trying to uh, put it all together and uh, make something happen. We wish you the best of luck. Thanks. Definitely. And you're only three and a half hours away, so hopefully you can do this again sometime. For sure, whenever, man. Like, uh, I don't have anything to do, really. So it's fun to get in the car. I like to drive. But so after this weekend of football, you'll have less to do, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. I'll just be counting down the days of spring training. I got your back. I'm going to root for the Vikings. And I'm actually going to wear a towel uh, for the whole game. Oh, yeah? Yeah. That big Ralph sent a towel, Minnesota Vikings towel. So yeah. in honor of TJ and big Aww. Ralph, I will wear that. I'll be, I'll be cheering for him because I already made a bet on him. There you go. Yeah. All right, folks. 
We are out of here. Thank you, TJ DeSantis, on Twitter, at TJ DeSantis. And, again, we were talking about on Patreon, if you want to support Between Rounds Radio. Check it out on Patreon. We will forward links, retweet links, so you can check it out because a lot of people from the MMA world are actually doing work there. So, anyway, uh, enjoy your weekend. Keep it locked on MMA Junkie throughout the weekend. We have Matt Erickson and Ken Hathaway in Boston. We have John Morgan out in L.A., so you'll have all kinds of coverage. And, of course, our writers and editors back home putting it all together. We'll see you on Monday to recap the events. And... Uh, that's it. We're out of here for Danny and Dan and Goes and TJ. I'm George. Have a nice weekend. Go out there and be champions. I